timer for tonight. Okay, just perfect. so you know. Okay. okay. Awesome. And Trevor, can you make yourself visible? Just so I know you're here. Uh, yeah, yeah, perfect. Good evening. Hey, remind me. Guys, I don't need a quorum for this, right? I can just get started. Dewana, maybe you might yeah. be able to. You can you can start. Okay. Because it's a work session. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we're gonna start exactly at 6 30 then. It gives us a, a little less than a minute. And I'm not sure whose camera is. I don't know if that's Principal Gresham or Dina, Mr. Stein, but you're, uh, you should turn your camera off to you. No one's camera should be on except for the Baltimore City Board of School Commissioners and my team. Hold on, Hold on, guys. So if you're not a Baltimore City School Commissioner, your camera should be off. All right, team, let's get started. Good evening and welcome to tonight's special work session for annual review. I want to thank the community for coming out um, and for the testimonies we will hear tonight. We will start tonight's session with a recap presentation from the executive director of the Office of New Initiatives, Ms. Angela Alvarez, followed by public testimony. Please keep your phones muted and videos off until it is your time to testify. Or you may be muted. Um, if you're not muted, you'll be removed from the call. I will now read a roll call of the board to identify who is on the call. So please identify yourself first before speaking on the record. Commissioner Brooks. Commissioner Chenya. Here. Commissioner Coy. Present. Commissioner Esposito. Here. Commissioner Griffin. Commissioner Kenyatta Bay. Present. Commissioner McFadden. McFadden is present. Commissioner Reed. Commissioner Roberts. Here. Commissioner Sally. Okay, and I'm here, so let's get started. I want to now turn it over to Ms. Alvarez for the presentation. All right. And I'm also joined by. Good evening. My name is Trevor Roberts. I'm a specialist in the Office of New Initiatives. And he's going to recap um, where we are tonight. Thank you to everyone um, for joining us for the operator work session. Um, the operator work session is part of the uh, operator renewal process. Uh, where we will be um, hearing from school communities that are going through renewal this year. Um, just a quick recap of where we are. Um, so on uh, this past Tuesday, February 14th, um, we presented the CEO's recommendations for operator renewal um, to the public at the board meeting. Um, tonight, we will be hearing from school commission or school communities um each school will have four minutes to testify in front of the board and the board will have an opportunity to ask questions and the um, vote on the recommendations will take place on thursday february 23rd at a special board meeting at 6 p.m here we see schools that are going through the renewal process um, and we will jump right in First school up is the Baltimore Collegiate School for Boys. Um, the school is recommended for a three-year renewal uh, with some conditions. Uh, the conditions are that the operator must hire personnel located in the Baltimore area and approved by city schools 
who are knowledgeable in K-12 education and requirements for public charter schools in Maryland. The school must show improvement in delivery of special education services and ensure compliance with requirements, improving practices around student behavior and ensuring due process for students, ensure compliance with schedule and the COMAR required courses and compliance with collect collectively bargained agreements and ensure compliance with grant management and operator capacity in general. Finally, the school must provide on-site EEOC training to improve practices in creative po creating positive workplace atmosphere for staff. Sessions for school leadership and operator staff, as well as school staff, must be scheduled and take place prior to the end of the current year. Here is a um, summary that was presented on Tuesday of uh, some of the highlights of the school. And um, with that, I'd like to turn it over to the Baltimore Collegiate School for Boys. So you guys can now turn on your cameras. We should take down the slide just so we can see them and anything they want to present. OK, good evening, everyone. Good evening, members of the Board of Commissioners, uh, Madam CEO, Dr. Santalisas, Baltimore City staff, peers and colleagues, parents and students. My name is Dr. Barney Wilson. I stand before you, you today to convince you to vote with your conscience and with our community to renew the charter of Baltimore Collegiate School for Boys. Let me first by thanking, um, let me first start by thanking Ms. Alvarez and her team for leading the charter renewal process. Dr. Santalisas, thank you for your vote of confidence in recommending that Baltimore Collegiate School for Boys receive a conditional, conditional three-year renewal. Uh, we believe that this recommendation is not only a vote for Baltimore Collegiate, but also a vote uh, for the boys in Baltimore who deserve a high-quality education in a single-gender learning environment. Uh, commissioners, my colleagues and I uh, took the time to listen very closely to Tuesday night's meeting, and I want to assure you that we take all of your renewal recommendations seriously. We heard our CEO say very clearly that Baltimore Collegiate cannot fail. We do not take these words lightly. We are not a perfect organization, but we are an organization striving for perfection, continuously improving. And I know that uh, with your vote of confidence, that we will get to the point of excellence for our boys. We have a limited time tonight, so there's some, there are four important points that I wanna make before uh, you ask your questions. First, we come before you knowing that we have some serious work to do uh, to make this conditional three-year renewal uh, a reality. Uh, we, we've addressed uh, all of the compliance concerns that uh, were requested of us. We addressed two more concerns this evening um, this evening to give you a level of confidence and, and comfort in us. We didn't make excuses. We don't, we won't, we will not make excuses for our shortcomings. Second, it takes strong leadership to build a great school. I want to show you that our leadership team is stronger than ever. Uh, myself, uh, Mr. Bridgers, uh, assistant principal, we are Baltimore based and we've had, we have a, year, a number of years of experiences working in this school district. Third, there are explanations and not excuses for its shortcomings. I admit that uh, you know, I made uh, mistakes as a principal. Um, it's been more than 11 years since I led Poly and I led uh, Reginald Lewis High School. Uh, returning um, at this time meant that I needed to come up with, uh, to speed with the district's practices and systems. And now I think I'm fully up to speed. I understand what's at stake. Um, our boys are receiving the Comar required courses. Um, uh, Mr. Bridges and myself have taken the um, suspension training in, uh, in December and we're ready to go. Fourth and importantly, our successes with the boys are real and palpable and we cannot give up. So at um, Baltimore Collegiate in 2022, over 40% of our boys attended uh, some of the finest uh, schools uh, here in Baltimore City. Um, high school. Uh, we've been complimented by those schools who received our boys. So schools like Poly City, School for the Arts, uh, Dunbar, etc. This year, our expectation uh, from the boys who um, 
will graduate this year, we, we expect that more of them will attend those schools and do well. Some will even serve as scholar athletes because of our robust sports program. Uh, we're proud of our initial class, the class we call our Vanguard class. 100% of them went to high school and 89% of them graduated within four years. The class that's about to graduate, 97% of them will graduate in four years from high school. Um, we, Mr. We Wilson, if you could, Mr. Wilson, that, so if you could our, wrap, Mr. Wilson, if you could wrap up your remarks. From Baltimore Collegiate. He also graduated from Poly, and now he's a proud um, student at Morehouse College. Um, so we're Mr. Proud Mr. Wilson, Mr. Wilson, Mr. Wilson, we know that, Mr. Wilson. Uh, when our boys return to our school, we don't have to tell them things like pull your pants up, uh, look me in the eye, shake my hand. Uh, and, and be a gentleman. As a matter of fact, Mr. We call Wilson, gentlemen, your, your time is uh, you know, uh, go through the school. I think he's way. somewhere, um, um, he can't hear us. But if someone's in the room with him, can, can they please get a word him to him? Um, his, his time is up. I don't know if he's in the same room. I see a Leslie. Leslie can Redland. you relay that? Yeah, Leslie, can you relay that? The time's up. He's still talking. His, we, the, he's, but he, he doesn't know we can't hear him because his, his, his time is up. I'm going to send him a message. Uh, and he also needs to be able to hear the board so that they can ask him questions. So just flagging, if anybody can hear, you need to uh, make that note. Mr. Wilson, are you able to hear? Can anyone over there hear us? Oh, uh, can you hear? Oh, uh, Mr. Wilson, I was your time was up. We wanted to um uh, have you conclude your remarks so that the board can ask you questions. I think we want to remind all the participants that everyone has four. Each school has four minutes. We cannot hear mute. you. I'm sorry, Mr. Wilson. Unmute. Okay. So yeah, I, I can hear you. And uh, we're prepared to answer questions at this time. Are there any questions from um, any of my fellow board commissioners? Commissioner Coy? Oh, I thought I saw your hand go up. That was actually Commissioner Chinya. Sorry. I'm sorry, try, um, trying to find the, the mute and the unmute is difficult tonight. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, okay. Um, it, one question that I have um, upon visiting the school was uh, just a, a concern around uh, the number of, of teachers that were not traditionally certified or fully certified in a large number of substitutes. And so I'm just, and I know there are a list of conditions, but um, one of the areas, especially in trying to improve academics, is really going to be dependent upon the quality of instruction. And so what, if any, strategy uh, is in place or are you anticipating in terms of uh, uh, hiring and, ma and, and maintaining um, fully certified teachers? Yeah, so hiring uh, certified teachers is one of our top priorities, not only hiring, but also retaining those teachers that we have this year who are certified. And so there are, we know that there are going to be at least three Baltimore City um, hiring fairs. So we will be at those. In addition to that, our foundation is doing a national search for teachers that we can push into the, the process for Baltimore City so that they uh, are recognized and, and onboarded by Baltimore City. So we're conducting a national search and we're even looking beyond the shores, uh, places like Nigeria and other places. Uh, one of our challenges, of course, are the J-1 visas. So we're looking uh, globally for teachers uh, to come and teach here. So we actually have this time, we have about 16 teachers and then eight are certified and then we have some conditionally certified teachers for them are conditionally certified so we want to retain uh, the teachers who are really doing a good job and we we'll want to strengthen our team by looking for teachers who can fill those vacancies okay thank you thank you
I have a question. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's Commissioner McFadden here. Um, alongside the question, is everyone able to hear me? Yes, I can hear. Great. Um, alongside the question that uh, Chair Emeritus Chenya just asked, um, we noticed um, some challenges the school um, has been having with special education um, and um, you know, several fate violations and um, additional support that the school system has had to offer the school to support um, our young people that are there. Um, what protocols and protections and processes have been put in place to support our students that are receiving special education services at um, that school? And how can you ensure us um, that we will not continue to see um, should the board vote to renew the charter um, as many challenges with special education services at that at that school? OK. So thank you. Uh, we started off this school year very optimistic. We had an, uh, an IEP chair, special ed chair. Unfortunately, um, there was a tragedy that took place um, in our chair's family and she um, was not able to uh, continue uh, because of what she faced it was very, very tragic. And so we, we scrambled for a while to have a, an IEP chair, a special ed chair. Uh, recently, uh, we got a lot of support from the school system. I want to thank um, Mr. Ship, Mr. Donne, and others for the support we got. We were able to partner with another school where we're sharing that person's um, chair. And then also our special ed chair came back. So now we have two people who are helping us. So we have a plan. One person is handling the meetings from this point forward. The other person's handling the backlog of meetings. And so we're catching up very rapidly. We're having practically a, uh, you know, an IEP meeting every day. And so you can imagine the amount of coordination that goes into that just to get caught up. We want to be fair to the parents and the students to make sure that you know any violation that we had that they're, they're make up services so that we can uh, you know make good on what the students uh, missed but our plan is in place and it's working and we uh, foresee that we will catch up and we'll stay on track in addition so in addition to the in a, go ahead go ahead i'm sorry I'm um, in addition, Commissioner McFadden. I want to share that um, we also are providing special education training for all of the staff, general education as well as special education. We have a, a wonderful team who's here working at the school, and they're working tirelessly to make sure that we don't have any more errors in this. In fact, uh, everyone is reporting. Uh, to the principal weekly, making sure that he has a good understanding of what is happening. He's himself is participating in um, meetings with the IEP chair who's supporting as well as our IEP chair who's actually recently returned to work. Um, we feel confident that we should not have any violations and I assure you that it is something that we are managing and watching appropriately to ensure we can move forward. Thank you. Next, we have Commissioner Sally and then Commissioner Roberts. Yeah, so thanks so much for uh, being here this evening um, and entertaining um, our questions. And one of the questions I have is thinking about our role on board in terms of ensuring um, that we're carrying out our fiduciary responsibilities. Uh, this is a school that um, has been cited in the past for um, challenges with implementing um, funds that are entrusted to it. What can we expect to see in terms of um, the school's continued and sustained progress um, and being responsible stewards of federal, state, and local resources? Hi, good afternoon. Um, Commissioner Sally, thank you so much for that question. Um, we were uh, disheartened um, at some point um, to learn that there were dollars earmarked for Baltimore Collegiate that had not been spent. And uh, we met very uh, quickly with uh, the Office of New Initiatives along with uh, the grants management team to discuss those uh, 
uh, funding expenditures uh, since we have put in place um, some protocols to make sure that we work very closely with folks that manage our Title I dollars, our Title IV dollars, all of the ESSER grant funding that we received and any other grant opportunities that come through the school. I'm happy to say that we do not have uh, financial issues as it relates to uh, our use of funds, but when we are given grant funds that should go uh, in the use uh, for our students, it is important that we spend those dollars and spend them appropriately. We've uh, met recently. Uh, we uh, use a, a back office operations uh, support team uh, called EDOPS. They work in a number of schools. We actually have met with recently with them to actually get additional support around grant funding, making sure that we can uh, access all of the funding opportunities available and spend those dollars appropriately. We meet very closely with the assistant principal, the administration of the school to make sure that we are discussing um, the expenditure of those dollars, meeting the grant deadlines and timelines that we need to. Uh, you should know that as a result of those funds that were not utilized, uh, there was some, the board got involved, uh, there was some, you know, uh, movement and transitions that happened in the organization as a result of that, because it is something that cannot be taken very lightly. So I would say to you and assure you that we have put systems in place. We are working with an external provider that provides a, an array of services to schools all over the country regarding the use of public dollars. And number three, we know that we need to use every penny to support our boys um, here at Baltimore Collegiate and we will continue to make sure that those dollars go directly uh, to support and benefit them and their learning. Yeah, I appreciate that very much. I mean, I do take that, um, and I, I certainly hope that the school takes that responsibility very seriously in terms of ensuring that each and every dollar is programmed um, as it is in its intent and use within uh, federal and state guidelines. Um, but part of that is ensuring that everybody who is responsible, that is from the school leader on down to the business manager, understands the requirements and responsibilities of those funds um, and its a proper use as, as well as expenditure timelines and deadlines. So I appreciate. What I'd also like to hear is just kind of a little bit more about just what is that sustained pathway? Like what is the training? Like what is, what are beyond just having an external third party put in place? Right. What are we doing to ensure that on an ongoing regular cadence that that those who are responsible the most understand what the, what's asked of them. Yes, I, I, your concern is my concern and our shared concern, I think globally, from the board of uh, trustees that have to fiduciarily manage and make sure that we're carrying, or they are carrying and executing their duties to the operator staff down to, uh, you're very correct, to the operations staff in the school. Um, first and foremost, I will say that um, in terms of execution of that, having the proper processes in place and understanding those dollars, uh, we've built a spreadsheet that actually accounts for all of those dollars across the organization. Uh, in that spreadsheet, if I showed it to you, it has the name of the person responsible uh, who is uh, the owner. Um, I'm a big believer in uh, decision-making matrices, right? So uh, the owner of those dollars, the contact person at the district office, um, uh, there are people in the district office who would smile right now because they know my name because I've called and talked to them to make sure that we are using those dollars appropriately. Um, I think in terms of uh, internally, we have to be able to earmark those dollars. We have to hear from our staff internally as to what their needs are. We have to be able to hear from parents as to where they think money should be appropriated and then steer those dollars down those pathways. So that is happening and we have really done a great job of being transparent um, in that way um, through the budget process season. Uh, but we also have to use and, and really support from having an on-site operations team um, here that actually um, is employed within our organization, understands the accountability uh, tied to uh, making sure that those reports are filed on time, making sure that we've expended the dollars on time, making sure that they understand how to access the district system. 
um, and making sure basically that we report on uh, what we're doing. So all of that, Commissioner Sally, is happening right now. And uh, proactively, we've, we've gone to really make sure that our uh, operations partner um, at Ops is also well steeped in what we're doing. So um, I definitely think that, that we are ahead of that. And um, it is my um, belief and commitment that we won't have that happen again. Yeah, the, I appreciate that. I mean, I'm just I'm also concerned that there's just a gap in terms of like the capacity building that actually needs to happen within on on site on local. You've got to have the right people in the staff who understand the entire process from building um, a comprehensive needs assessment to leveraging those dollars appropriately to moving them out um, to support students and scholars. So, I appreciate um, your responses this evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Commissioner Roberts, next was that was that right, Tanisha? Commissioner yes, Roberts. we have Commissioner Roberts, and then we have Commissioner Brooks. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you to the Boys Collegiate School for Boys uh, School Community for um, being with us tonight. Um, I think one, um, I want to lead by saying, as a graduate of City Schools and of a of the oldest all girl public high school in the United States of America that I can certainly appreciate um, the environment of attending a same-sex school community. Um, my questions, quite honestly, were already posed by Commissioner Sally. I think for me, one thing that I wanted to name in this moment was um, this board certainly finds significant value of this school model we find significant value of there being targeted efforts to provide leadership and academic um, opportunity for students. Our young boys, mostly young black boys in this city, we find significant value in that. Where we are apprehensive as a board is around its leadership and where it has historically been and where, his, where it will go in the future. Um, I know that I've, I've heard remarks around, you know, we're, it's a new school leader. Welcome. You gave us a fabulous tour. Thank you so much for inviting us into your space. But one thing that has been true is the operator has been consistent. This has been the same operator from the beginning. And so for us, that is a huge part of the apprehension around what the future of this school community looks like. And, and that for me, as a mom of a fourth grade boy, that looking at middle grade currently as a school board member and as a mom, it is unnerving to know that the internal processes that be school are what we're just considering at this point, certain systems that should have been in place four school locations ago. And so I don't not want that to be something that you know my colleagues are not considering because our students can't get these grades back. So while we're figuring it out, our students don't get that time back. And so tonight, I, I appreciate all of your remarks, all of your plans to move forward, but also I want to, to bring that lens as a mom and as a school board member of a little black boy that could be in your school, that is what's most unnerving for me. Okay. Yeah, I can't speak to the uh, three, so um, then I'm going to defer to. I'll, I'll take that question, and I will. Um, and thank you, Commissioner Roberts, uh, for your uh, question. And we certainly want to build a school that you, any commissioner, and anyone in the city would be proud to send their son to. In fact, I have a. Um, a teacher who's uh, been a long story teacher here in this building. And she said that to me this year, this is the school that she would finally enroll her child in. Um, and so we're getting there. But to give you some assurance and to uh, uh, really color um, the apprehension that you're feeling about the leadership of the school, um, having worked in schools over time, there can be transition. And, this past several years, I think transition has been evident 
Um, but here, I think the operator has not been consistent. Um, the operator and founder of this school, yes, has been the found Five Smooth Stones Foundation, but there has been changes within that operator, operator leadership that has actually helped, has helped to build the partnership with the district, has helped to bridge uh, partnerships with staff, has helped to bridge partnerships with the community, has changed, I think, the overall tenor of what we know to be important uh, for this school to exist in the city. And so uh, the chief executive officer of the Five Smooth Stones Foundation, who was hired by the Board of Trustees, is uh, Mr. Edwin Avent, uh, who had been a longtime supporter of the organization, a uh, board member of the organization. And when he saw that things were not going the way that they needed to, took a stand um, and said, this can't happen on my watch. And he rallied the board, he rallied um, individuals um, to come to support the organization, um, along with myself. <laughs> uh, my name is Leslie Redwine. I've been um, a consultant to Baltimore Collegiate for a number of years supporting this school. And what I will say is that um, I have watched the school make really tough decisions. The tough decision over the past year has been really changing the leadership of the school to to lessen your fears and give you apprehension. The leadership of the school today is far different from the leadership that I've ever seen. Um, the leadership is Baltimore based uh, men who understand um, what it takes to educate boys of color. And I think that has built trust with staff, has built trust with parents and has built trust with our boys. I uh, feel that the culture and climate of this school is directly changed as a result of the leadership who are here in the school today. Dr. Wilson has done a fine job of being able to come into the school and build the relationships, but it, I would be remiss <laughs> not to mention uh, Mr. Kelvin Bridgers, another, another long storied um, uh, administrator in Baltimore City who has completely transformed and turned around this work. Every single day that I come into this building, I ask these gentlemen, are you, are you here to stay? Their hearts are in this work. They could be somewhere else, but they believe in the mission of the school. So much so that Dr. Wilson was someone who we went and found in Nigeria and wooed him back. He had other major opportunities to stay in Africa and do the work that he was doing, but he wanted to come home and he wanted to come home particularly to lead this school. Are you okay, Commissioner? Okay, okay. And so Mr. Bridgers, another one, well sought after uh, individual, um, has done some work. I wanna, he, he was standing behind me. He's being shy right now. But I would say our young men and gents in this school have responded so uh, welcomely to these gentlemen who have actually given their blood, sweat, and tears to really make this work. And so I, I, I hope that when you visited our school and toured the school, you could see that. Um, and I think that if you continue to come here and know that here's Mr. Bridger sitting down behind me, but I think that for, for us, they are here late at night. They're here on Saturdays. They're on the phone in the evenings um, doing the work that their hearts are le leading them to do. And I think that we wanna continue this because the momentum is great. When we talk about academic achievement results and no one is happy with where we are in the city right now, but when we talk about academic achievement results in terms of where our boys are going and how they're performing and how they're stepping up to the challenge, they are responding to these two leaders. And I would say we're on to something with that we just cannot uh, let die. So thank you so much for your question. I, wanna, I want you to hold us accountable provided how the outcome of this um, vote goes in terms of uh, the renewal of the school, but know that the direction we're heading in is one that you will be proud of. And I hope that you will consider uh, sending your son to Baltimore Collegiate. Thank you, Ms. Redwine and Commissioner Roberts. If, did you have an additional um, follow-up? No, I, I was just gonna say, so. I look forward to seeing, seeing those changes. Thank, Thank you. you. I want to move us along to Commissioner Brooks. Um, Thank you.
Uh, Commander McFadden, um, actually, um, I'll just uh, yield my question, um, and so we can uh, keep it moving. Thank you. No, please, by all means, Dr. Brooks. Oh, okay, all right. <laughs> Uh, so, um, so thank you all again for the presentation and I know there's a lot of uh, work and hard decisions that you all had to make. I guess what I'm really would love to hear you all talk me through in terms of um, not only the structure of the sort of the changes that you're making to advance the academics of, of, uh, of our students, but um, I know that there were sort of, for some at least, uh, lifting of concerns around sort of culture and climate at the institution, specifically for our um, young boys and staff. Could you talk to me a little bit about sort of specifically how you all have been implementing changes to sort of ensure, one, first conceptualize psychological safety um, for our young people and your staff, and then two, um, what specific strategies are you using for interventions to ensure that the needs, the holistic needs of our students and the staff at your, at your school um, will be better prepared and better positioned to actually uh, grow and develop uh, as an institution? Okay. <clears throat> You're just speaking for my, my just, okay great sorry i just used you okay so um you know the climate culture is where we started uh we we said that we said that, that we, um, we have we can't really have teaching, teaching active teaching in the classroom we settled down the culture of the building and so again mr bridgers um the assistant principal has a team of people who work with him specifically on the climate and culture of the building. And so uh, we separated out our elementary and our middle schools. So we have a team of people who are focused on the elementary levels, and then we have a team of people who are focused on the middle school level. And so we believed, uh, so we have a four year plan. The first year, year of the plan is focus and discipline, settling down the climate and culture of looking at our academics, getting the academics of settling down the climate and culture, even in the classroom. We have an intercession coming up next week, and more than half of the intercession will be about classroom management, um, climate and culture. How do we meet the needs of all of our students, including our special needs students? And so we have some consultants coming in, and we also have some in-house presentations to focus on that. Um, so it's a long term thing uh, at this point. If you come into the building, you'll see it's not like it was before. It's a quieter building. Uh, the students are in the classroom. We don't have many students walk in the hallways. Um, and so the teachers can teach because the overall climate and culture of the school is settled down. We have people uh, on post. Uh, we have transitions in place uh, to walk the, the boys from class to class. We also um, have we know our gents we we call them gents instead of boys we know our gents um, we know uh, who needs special attention we approach them with dignity and give them the space to be themselves we also because boys have a lot of energy uh, we have a lot of things in place for them we have a very robust sports program we have recess uh, we have um, a game room that we've added we're adding a gaming room and so we're meeting the boys where they are so, for example, at lunchtime, the boys have an option. They can go into the game room. They eventually will be able to go into the gaming room. They can also go into the gym. Uh, they can go into uh, a chess room that we have set up. And so we're looking at our boys for who they are and the energy that they bring. And we're supporting the teachers in the same way. I want to add, add to this, to this um, as, um, well, as well, uh, Commissioner, and make sure that I uh, well roundedly answer your question because I think. You were asking the question not just about um, what we're doing for boys, and I think what Dr. Wilson has shared is um, right on point, but I also think that what you're also referring to is what we're providing for staff who are working in our schools. Um, first and foremost, I, I would be remiss uh, not to acknowledge the wonderful teachers who give their time and effort to come work at Baltimore Collegiate every day. Um, I, I can say that every educator in America would say this is not easy work, um, but to, to work specifically with our community, um, I think it's a tough work and um, they, uh, they give a lot and they need to, to receive a lot. 
And I think that in terms of what I have been most proud of this year to witness is that when Dr. Wilson walked into the building, he wanted to understand the staff and build relationships with them in a way that will allow him to lead the team. And I think he's done a really great job at doing that, providing opportunities to break bread together, opportunities to uh, learn together, um, and opportunities to socialize together. That's important, I think, for the type of work we do. It's kind of work hard, and you have to find another way to, to really support the staff. I think that we are, as we look to the intercession next week, uh, we're looking to spend that time in reflection. Uh, we're looking to spend that time in transparency. We're looking to spend that time hearing and listening. Um, we have a specific focus group lined up for that meeting um, to really use that time as a listening tour with staff so we can figure out what they're feeling. Um, I know this work has not felt great to a lot of people. Um, I'm just gonna be honest. We are in the midst of coming out of a pandemic. We're in the midst of a, a teacher crisis across the country. People are being asked to do things that they might not like to do. Um, but for the most part, our staff, they're rolling up their sleeves. They're in this work, but I think we have to focus on wellness. I know that that's a huge focus at the district. That's a huge focus of ours. Um, I know we have to focus on just providing different pathways for people to heal, um, for people to recover um, in this work, and we want to do that. Um, I also want to make mention that, um, one of the conditions Ms. is Ms. Uh, Redwine, can you about um, really can you providing um, training to, um, to our me? operator staff along with anyone our administrative leaders, hear me? Hello. and we're going to do that. So we've already started that process. Hi, Ms. Redwine, Mr. Edwin, is anyone able to Thank you. you I'm so sorry me? for thank being you. on I just want to make sure, thank you, Commissioner Esposito, that we begin wrapping up so that we can um, move on to the other schools that we have this evening. Are there any additional questions? Thank you so much, uh, uh, Ms. Alvarez. I believe that we are now ready for a Baltimore International Academy. Yep. Um, um, and for, forgive me, uh, Dr. Brooks, was that it for for your question, Commissioner Brooks? I, I did have a follow up, but it is okay. I know we need to move on. Um, and, uh, and, and so I appreciate you looping back, um, Commissioner McFadden, but I am a-okay, I'm uh, moving on. Okay. Ms. Alvarez. Yep. Okay, I, I just want to take the, the, the minute to thank the board, school board of commissioners. And I do want to, I want to recognize our students in the background. If you give us this one second, we'd like to do our creed. Is that okay? Okay, time to move quickly. Okay, you ready? One, two, three. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you so much for that. Ms. Alvarez? Yep. So Baltimore International Academy, um, they're recommended for a three-year renewal. They're operated by Baltimore International Academy, Inc. They're rated developing academics, effective in climate, effective in financial management and governance. I'm gonna have um, uh, the BIA team you can go ahead and turn on your cameras. Just a reminder for members of the public, only the BIA team should have their cameras on, as well as the uh, Board of School Commissioners. So we're going to take down our slide and turn it over to them. Good evening, Board of Commissioners, Dr. Centralistas, and all. Thank you. My name is Kona Fasia Fremenepe. I'm the operator, Dr. Kona Fasia Fremenepe. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you about BIA East. 15 years ago in this ballroom, commissioners like you had a difficult decision to make. They were torn between approving or not approving our charter application that was based purely on promise, research, and examples of data from other schools. 
They made the decision to approve BIA's charter because they wanted to give the children of Baltimore an educational opportunity that was not in its portfolio, a multilingual baccalaureate model. We are here again 15 years later presenting you with another difficult decision of considering to change our three-year renewal to five years. However, this year, this time, we come with a promise, for, uh, promise fulfilled, our historical data of academic success, our history of providing students, students with well-rounded education and a track record with the district. We recognize that this year, the data was not what the kind of outcome that we wanted for our children, but we own our results and we are putting in place measures that will address them. We have engaged expertise, the expertise of national board certified math and ELD professionals who will not only provide intervention to our students, but also professional development to our teachers. Esteemed Board of Commissioners and Dr. Centelis, we ask that you please consider giving BIA East a five year renewal term that will allow enough time, the time needed to gain uh, the intended outcome for our children. Thank you in advance. Colleagues, next colleague. BIA team, next person, please. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Yelena Lacunia, and I am BIA East Principal. Uh, BIA was developing in only one of the three main renewal categories, and that was for overall academics. We know we need to work on improving our five-year survey as well as our math scores. School leaders have determined that they will make some modifications, additions to its current strategies for student achievement and growth, and we will focus in math particularly. This includes add external tutors to work with the students to provide them with different approaches to learning. Focus on the in-school interventions to meet the needs of all students. Increase social emotional learning strategies to help students with self-management and readjusting to in-person learning. Increase teacher training on using data analysis to modify classroom instruction. Reinforce with the teachers procedures for 504 and IEP plans for students with disabilities and accommodations for English language learners. Recommendations from instructional staff, integrating released MCAP items in daily instructions and including MCAP scaffolding practice, conducting parent workshops that will help with the children's academics, reteaching foundational skills. The district, the state of Maryland, and indeed, the entire nation have been experienced in staffing crisis, and this is compounded for us as a language immersion school that seeks highly qualified teachers who are native or near native speakers of our target languages. My name is Jeannie Cobb. I've been with the school for almost the beginning for a good 14 years. And once again, we're um, asking- I'm sorry, Ms. Cobb. Each yes. school gets four minutes and you've hit the four minute mark. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions or uh, comments from board colleagues? As my board colleagues are um, gathering their thoughts or their questions, I'm curious to know what innovative strategies um, are you all using to recruit and retain a high quality teaching force um, to support um, some of those challenges that we're seeing at the school as far as math is concerned, as far as MCAT? Um, readiness is concerned for our students to um, thrive there. Um, for, first, we appreciate you all for being here and the work that you've done um, with, with our students and our children in Baltimore City. But I'm curious to know what innovative strategies are you all um, planning to um, employ to recruit and retain high quality teachers to support the improvement process um, for academic programming at your school? Thank you for having us and for the question. Good question, especially for an immersion school. Um, we 
first of all, recognize that all of our teachers have to be highly qualified, not only in the language, but also in the educational um, um, aspect of, of, of the teaching. The innovative uh, strategies that we've used in the past, uh, when we started newly, we used to be able to bring in teachers uh, from abroad to teach here. And then that went away when the school could no longer uh, offer the visas necessary. We've been to um, a place like uh, Puerto Rico where visas were not issues, and also um, to um, really work on this now. Uh, we are trying to put together a, a, a teacher, immersion teacher retention and a pipeline where we will identify teachers that are already that already have the content area of in speak the language that we will train and try to partner with the district to have a, 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 an alternative certificate. Our strategies include include uh, growing our own. For example, in our school, we hire uh, paraprofessionals. For example, for the Arabic program, that paraprofessional then is trained in house and becomes the teacher for the first grade. We recruit paraprofessionals and train them to become uh, uh, teachers in a pipeline. And we'll also uh, seek uh, teachers from abroad. In addition, if I may add, uh, we do have our on-site mentorship program. Each new teacher is assigned with mentor. All our teachers attend systemic uh, new teacher There's institute. To cancel. In addition, we have BIA, we have established BIA, Summer Leadership Institute, where we train our teachers not only for the content area, but we also train them for our two school signatures, Language Immersion and IB International Baccalaureate. Thank you. While commissioners still may be thinking, I'm also interested in just hearing a little bit more about specific strategies for improvement. So, yes, there is you know, making sure that there's a high quality teaching force that is present in the school because we know that our teachers are the heart and soul of our schools and when they are prepped and ready, um, you know, to the best of all abilities, then our students are in the in a, in a good place to thrive. Um, but, but how else are we um, going to be able to hear and see some plans for um, for academic improvement? What are some additional strategies? Um, I can begin and Tim can uh, join me. Some of the strategies that we have that we we believe uh, will be in place to support our student achievement are um, our after school tutoring, but also extended learning opportunities, opportunities for the students in reading and math. We have our summer school academic opportunities for students. We have our academic reading uh, uh, reading academy for the students who are transitioned to the formal English language instructions. We also focus during the school hours on a small group intervention and instructions in both in reading and math. We increase a number of our intervention teachers, especially math, to work on our math scores. We also provide professional development and training opportunities for the teachers and have so many a uh, uh, school-based wor workshop, both in uh, ANET that we used in the past, and now we move to IRAD. Um, we also have a system in place when our teachers have opportunity to participate in peer work, in peer observations, when you go and observe different classroom instructions, especially highly effective instructions, and implement the same practices in, in their classrooms. We believe in the collaboration and we believe in collaborative grade level meetings. When we bring teachers together, we develop lessons together, we analyze the data, we analyze student sample work, and we also share best practices that works in some of the classroom and try to implement the same strategies for other teachers. Thank you for that. Many of our schools, especially after recovery, uh, well, during this recovery period in city schools are engaging in a lot of those practices. Um, are there any additional questions or thoughts from board commissioners? 
Thank you so much, uh, BIA, Ms. Alvarez. Okay, so the next school we're gonna be looking at is Baltimore Leadership School for Young Women, uh, operated by the Foundation for Baltimore Leadership School for Young Women. The recommendation is a three-year renewal. Um, the school is rated developing in academics and effective in climate and financial management and governance. Good evening, everyone. My name is Siobhan Hall-Smith, and I serve as the CEO for the Foundation for the Baltimore Leadership School for Young Women. Tonight, I'm joined by Board Chair Carla Henry Hopkins, Principal Dana Collins, Middle School Math Interventionist Anna Kuo, and Class of 2019 alumna De'Ara Kuther. We will highlight our contributions to the district's portfolio, including our growth areas and longstanding success in college and career readiness. As a college preparatory school, Bliss's CCR rating was considered not effective for the class of 2021. Due to the pandemic, the class of 21 had extremely limited access to ACT and SAT tests. Further, many colleges and universities were test optional for admissions during this time. Regarding career preparation, based on our students' needs and in alignment with the blueprint for Maryland's future, in 2018, Bliss partnered with the Urban Alliance to provide career training as an equitable pathway to post-secondary career success. With nearly 70% of our students experiencing poverty, we understand the importance of our seniors having access to competitive salaries while participating in a career training education program. Although nearly 50% of our students completed Urban Alliance internships before graduation, unfortunately, this partnership with Urban Alliance was not calculated for our CCR renewal rating. I will turn it over to Principal Collins. Hi, I'm, I'm Dana Collins, Bliss's principal and the first internal candidate. I have over a decade of experience at the school. After years of turnover in school leadership, as of June 2022, our teachers were not satisfied. This was demonstrated through the five essential survey when the school was rated as partially organized for improvement. Before receiving the 5 e results last spring, we restructured our school leadership model to include three grade level assistant principals to provide a targeted focus on the needs of our school. This administrative structure allows for differentiation and supports our community's needs. When reflecting on school-wide needs, similar to the renewal report, we focused on whole girl wellness, which includes student attendance, math growth, and sustainable school leadership. As a result, we added a math and English multi-classroom leader to coach teachers and provide small group instruction. Middle school math teachers partner with an open up master teacher to incorporate instructional routines and lesson planning. This new curriculum encourages student growth through problem solving and hands-on learning. Also, the math department has conducted professional learning cycles to improve student to student interaction and discourse. Additionally, we have a co teaching model that supports students with disabilities and underperforming students. Our entire school leadership team, myself included, conducts student home visits. We want to know firsthand the barriers preventing our students from attending school. And I'll pass it to Ms. Kuo. My name is Anna Kuo, and I'm the middle school math intervention teacher. Middle school math is an area of growth. Before our students can be college ready, they need to be middle school ready. We recognize that the curriculum alone was not enough to improve our students' math comprehension. Therefore, we implemented a research-based systematic approach to math instruction. After receiving the 2019 park assessment data, we ensured that math intervention courses were offered during the school day, leveraging the expertise of special educators to collaboratively team teach with our general educators. The middle school schedule was adjusted to include math intervention courses for students because after school coach classes were not practical for our families. Students enrolled in the course are those who did not receive mandated instructional services. However, they were performing at least two grade levels below the state standard. Students are placed in the intervention courses based on their academic performance on iReady or NWEA MAP scores. Intervention courses do not exceed 15 students and are groups based on their skill deficit rather than grade level. The curriculum if you could wrap up your final thought, please. I'll, I'll turn it over to Ms. Kuther. Please. My name That's is- That's your four minutes. That's your four minutes. Um, could, could we let the student just say absolutely, a word? Absolutely. I, I was about to um, 
just yield my time for the student so that we could hear from um, the student that was that was here from the school. Where'd she go? Because I don't see her anymore. My name is Sierra Kutha, this class is 2019. Um, I started this in the sixth grade. I did not take school seriously. My school GPA and class schedule did not reflect on my academic capacity. While my businesses and I were exposed to many opportunities like AP and CTE courses that did not prepare me for college. It did support, but Bliss did support me as a whole, like Ms. Collins' reading intervention class and our college destination program. These intentional efforts ensured that I attended the college of my dream and prepared me for the college work level. I matriculated into college immediately after graduation, earning 12 summer college credits, receiving a 3.5 um, GPA, and currently maintaining placement on the dean's list. I represent Bliss and my HBCU as a White House fellow, and I am majoring in education, looking forward to graduating in May 2024. Daily, I can recognize that Bliss prepared me for my future. I am a Bliss alum who will transform Baltimore young woman, one young woman at a time. Thank you. That's beautiful. That That's beautiful. Now, I thought that I thought you were a current student, um, but you're certainly an alum, an, an alumnus of, um, of Bliss. Thank you for sharing. Um, school board colleagues, uh, commissioners, do you have any thoughts um, or questions for uh, the the Bliss uh, the the Bliss family? I'd like to know a little bit more about. Um, to uh, Miss Anna, I, I wasn't able to catch your um, full last name, but when you talk about math intervention, particularly in the middle grades, um, what I'm noticing right now in my professional practice is not always does, thank you, I see Commissioner Coy, not always does uh, map um, uh, correlate to uh, success on MCAP. You know, MCAP is there are some challenges there. So can you just illuminate a little bit more um, some of the strategies that you all are using, particularly in the middle grades, because from what from what I can see, that Algebra 1 course, um, we want to try to offer that as soon as possible, um, if students are ready for it by eighth grade, but certainly by ninth grade, and we want to see that we want to see proficiency. So it's one it's one thing for them to um, be exposed to the course. It's another thing for them to be successful in that course because we know that sets them up for a, a better trajectory for college, career, and life. So just illuminate on that, and then I'll go to Commissioner Coy and then our Chair Emeritus uh, Chenya. Of course, thank you for your question. Um, I think the math intervention program uh, and the reason for creating it is because we identified that a lot of us, our students uh, had those gaps uh, and couldn't really approach those questions because of those prerequisite skills that were needed for algebra for that algebra one course. And that's exactly what we are fo focusing on. Uh, we also um, are uh, changing our approach in um, teaching uh, by conducting professional learning cycles to really encourage student to student interaction and discourse because the one way approach or uh, lecture approach of teaching is not working and they learn better from each other. So I think in combination uh, identifying that um, working and um, ident uh, um, working on those gaps, um, uh, prerequisite skills for algebra, um, that was the best way uh, and especially on a small group environment, that's what made has made the, uh, the difference for our students. If, if I could jump in as well, just as a, an additional note about the um, the the other thing we are doing um, beyond just the math intervention, we did hire uh, who was a, an expert teacher at our school already. She moved into Miss um, Imwald moved into the multi classroom leader position. So her role is to teach two sections of Algebra two, as well as coach our middle school math teachers. So she is in their classrooms every day, uh, supporting with small group um, and providing that instruction um, support, as well as providing um, feedback on their teaching every day. Thank you, Commissioner Coy. Yes, thank you for the presentation. And my question relates to, to something that you brought up, that you all brought up in your discussion, which is the five essentials. In, in some of the, the data coming out from, from that analysis, 
program coherence and principal teacher trust were two things that this were raised up. Could you speak to, to what steps are being taken to help ensure that programs that you know are are implemented are followed through and that there's improved teacher principal trust. I think you spoke a little bit to that, but I'd like to hear some more. Okay. I can take that question. I don't know if my camera is working as well as I would like. It it is? Okay. So I'll start with the second part of your question and that is regarding principal trust. So during our last renewal uh, cycle, we piloted a co-principal model with a principal for the middle school and a principal for the upper school. We ultimately found that our school, although that is a great model, it wasn't the best model for our school community. So in that time, we then took our time to transition back to a single principal model with the support of assistant principals. Last year, we had a, a principal in place and we also only had one assistant principal and that one assistant principal was Ms. Collins. When we recognized the needs of our school community were definitely suffering, we had to look internally. We had to also press the pause button to recognize what does our school need. And we knew that our school needed a school leader that knew the community, that was invested in the community such that it would give the community what it needed to be successful. We recognize that educating young women, it is not an easy task. So we definitely wanted someone who knew our school community inside and out, and that is Dana Collins. She has been at our school for a decade. She is what we call a homegrown leader. She came to us as a teacher, De'Ara shared, she was her reading intervention teacher, a special educator, teacher mentor, assistant principal, and now she is serving as our principal. But we know just based on the experience of a principal in urban settings, we also know that based on the experience of principals in urban settings, I having been one, there is a lot of support that principals need. So we definitely wanted to add and undergird Ms. Collins with the assistant principals that she needed to ensure that our mission and vision continues to be actualized. For your second question regarding how do we ensure fidelity to programming, we, de we uh, in 2020, we launched an ambitious strategic plan for our organization. In this five-year plan, we outlined what were our priorities. We knew first we had to talk about academics, we also knew that in order for our girls, to, or excuse me, young women, to be successful in the college or career of their choice, we had to make sure that they were whole. We are not saying that they came to us broken. We want to enhance what they already bring to the table. So we made an investment in whole world wellness. So it's similar to what the district's approach is for student wellness, but there is a very specific approach that we're taking for black and brown girls in our school community. The third is definitely investing in the people who serve our girls. So investing in the talent that exists in our building. So that ranges for us, we had to streamline professional development, providing a Bliss Brilliance Award so that teachers did not have to go into their own pockets to go to professional development and wait to be reimbursed. We know that if we invest in you, we're going to invest in you fully as a teacher. And our fourth piece is definitely making sure that what we put in place, it is sustainable. So we streamlined our programs so that when we are no longer in these seats, these four pillars would continue well beyond where we are so that young women of Baltimore can have the programming that we promised to their families, once again, long after we are not here. So we've streamlined our programs into those four key areas in alignment with our strategic plan. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Commissioner Coy, um, if I may um, move to Chair Emeritus, and then if you have any follow-up, we can circle back. Um, Chair Emeritus, Chenya. Thank you. Um, I, I, it was interesting you mentioned earlier about your uh, work, uh, the Urban Alliance, and that it wasn't uh, recognized uh, for the college and career readiness. And I just wanted to know uh, what has happened with that or, or what other strategy or what other partnership are you using since that was one of the areas that was still listed as not effective? So we are doubling down on our partnership with the University of Baltimore. So when we look at dual enrollment, it's not solely, we're not solely using dual enrollment as an opportunity for acceleration. We're also using it as an opportunity for an intervention. So we recognize that based on our math data, when our students come to us, we understand that they sometimes are coming to us below grade level and we're working as quickly as we can to get them on level before they go to the college or university of their choice. 
When that does not happen, we're leveraging the partnership with University of Baltimore to provide those developmental courses while they are still in high school so that they don't have to pay for non-credit bearing courses. When we think about CTE as a small school, we really had to leverage our resources. So what CTE program could we offer that would also prepare our, our young women to have lucrative careers if they had to work and go to school. So right now we are looking into expanding our computer science pathway or the CTE pathway for computer science. So right now we are two courses in and those two courses include foundations of technology and advanced placement computer science principles. So it's meeting both components of the blueprint, the advanced placement component along with the CTE component. So we're a small school, so we have, like I said, we have to leverage our resources and we're not at a place where we can offer an abundance of CTE courses. So that is our approach as we're moving forward. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Commissioner Coy, I'm going to circle back. I still see your hand up. Did you have um, something additional? Uh, I, I tried to lower it. I, I'm good. I no, no question further. Thank you. Four colleagues, any commissioner? Any additional colleagues and commissioner merging the word together? Any additional thoughts? Thank you so much to the Bliss team. Um, thank you so much to the the young women, um, the alumna, the alumnus that's here with us, and the staff that's working hard. Thank you all for um, the presentation and for the additional information um, beyond what we've already had. Thank you all so much, Miss Alvarez. Thank you. And the next school is Coppin Academy, operated by Coppin State University. The recommendation is for a three-year renewal. The school is developing in academics and climate and effective in financial money. All right, folks, next stage stop, 20 minutes, going out. We're going out to be 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30, 30. Hello, uh, good evening, commissioners. I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, thank you. I heard some backdrop and didn't know if that was disturbing our ability to communicate. I am Anthony Jenkins. I'm the president of Coppin State University. I have uh, my Coppin State University and my Coppin Academy leadership team here with me. Uh, I am here to uh, um, put forth um, the understanding that Coppin Academy and Coppin State University, in my opinion, are synonymous as one institution of learning for our high school students moving on to college. As the president, I am committed to making sure that Coppin Academy receives the support that it uh, needs for our students to be successful. As the operator of Coppin Academy, uh, Coppin State has made significant investments over the last several years since I arrived in 2020 to make sure that we strengthen the foundation of Coppin Academy and the learning framework of the students who are moving through Coppin Academy. Um, I would also like to make note that uh, we have invested resources, uh, nearly a million dollars uh, moving forward in developing Coppin Academy. Uh, we are also investing resources with regards to um, uh, personnel. We have hired Dr. Scott, who you may have the opportunity to speak with here soon, about strengthening uh, uh, the foundation of Coppin Academy, but also with her expertise being a, a stronger liaison between Coppin State University and Coppin Academy. I am asking for you to consider a five-year renewal for Coppin State and Coppin Academy. I think that that gives us a much longer runway to meet the expectations and the goals that we have for Coppin Academy. We are also uh, looking at how we wrap better wraparound support services around our students uh, to enhance their overall holistic development. And I am pleased to say that what we've started thus far since I arrived in 2020, uh, we are seeing significant returns on those investments. With that, I will pause uh, and turn it over to Principal Allman so that we have enough time for her to provide any more specific details about our relationship. Principal Allman. Thank you. Can you see my screen? Is everyone yes, able to can. see the presentation? Great, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jenkins. Um, and as we um, continue, I wanted to share uh, these highlights that we have for our foundation of our current success, our exemplary early college model, 
and the idea that we continuously uh, um, service our students and give them high wage, high need career opportunities. Um, we also have shared resources, as uh, Dr. Jenkins has alluded to, the Eagle Achievement Center that uh, all of our students have, will have access to, uh, the engagement with Coppin State University faculty and students, and then also the high quality teaching uh, staff. We have four teacher professors who are considered um, adjunct faculty as well as high school certified teachers. Uh, we know that also our graduation rate and our location have shown to be uh, foundations for our success. We have a safe and nurturing environment. Um, we want to ensure that there are wraparound services for all of our students so that they can be their best. We recognize that there are some areas for improvement and we're not shying away from the hard work that we have to do to get uh, ourselves back on track and be at the top of our game. We have innovative strategies in place so that our students are able to um, reach the MCAP scores that they need. We have uh, some of the strategic grouping um, this year being able to offer uh, accelerated math and English um, opportunities for ninth and 10th graders. Uh, restorative if practices. Your if you could wrap up your final thoughts. Sure, the restorative practices and also the innovative family engage engagement strategies, uh, making sure that our families are elevated as learning partners. Commissioner McFadden. Um, sir. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. I was just thanking um, Principal Allman for being here. It's good to see you, Principal Allman, and certainly uh, Dr. Jenkins, thank you so much for um, being present with us tonight. Um, and welcome to Baltimore City um, and leading one of our um, historically black colleges and universities here in the city. Um, I do see two hands raised. I will lead with um, our board chair, Chair Richardson. Um, followed by Commissioner Reed and then Commissioner Coy. Thank you, um, Vice Chair McFadden. I just, I do have questions around culture and climate of the school. There, there are a couple of um, not effectives um, as I look at your, your report um, with your family surveys as well as suspension. So can you talk to us a little bit about the work um, that you all are doing around the climate of the school and, um, you know, strategies that you will be implementing um, in, within this next round? Sure. Um, thank you for that question. And uh, we recognize that there are some areas that, um, that we definitely have to work through. And we have um, several plans in place. Um, to answer that around um, the climate, we recognize that our suspension rate has gone up. However, we want to ensure that students um, that we follow the code of conduct, but we recognize that we have to provide additional resources in between um, students being moved from um, removed from class. And so this year we um, uh, partnered with a contractor, um, Fox Consulting, and with the development of with teachers and with leadership, we created a integrative um, behavior management plan. Um, we also trained our student advocates. Uh, so that they could um, help to de-escalate some of the issues that teachers may have in classrooms to keep students in classroom as much as possible. Um, we also recognize that we have to um, provide some um, mental health supports and wellness to students. Uh, and so we do um, pay for a full-time social worker. Um, and we also work with our related service mm -hmm. providers um, so that they can offer um, the clinical support that students have. Um, our community school coordinator is a, a Coppin Academy alum. I'm sorry, a Coppin Academy alum. And she's also a Coppin State University alum. And she's working on her master's at Coppin State now. And she is um, serving as the community school coordinator. And she works very hard to bring in the partnerships based on the needs assessment that she conducted um, I'm not sure if Kayla is on, um, but uh, we are very proud of um, of her work 
and partnering um, with everyone in the building so that we can get the synergy to ensure that students um, receive the supports that they need to lower the um, hours um, that they're not in school. Thank you. Commissioner Reed. Uh, Dr. Jenkins, thank you for, uh, for showing up. Uh, I know you've elevated the game in terms of copping from a facilities, talent, and financial standpoint. But from your seat, I guess this is probably the only, I may be wrong, this may be the only school that's on a college campus in the area. How do no, you you're see? absolutely correct. What's the, from, the, from your seat, what do you see the biggest needs, the biggest concerns of Coppin Academy and your relationship with Coppin Academy? Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, that's a great question. So I'll say one of the things that in, in our conversations, what we looked at was what we were not doing early on was having a stronger relationship from Coppin State to Coppin Academy with regards to curriculum development, leadership development, uh, 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 resources, and really engaging the, the students in a more holistic way. Over the last several years, we have done that more, and we've seen, as I said earlier, some good returns on that. Uh, I think those are three uh, elements that we've focused on and we're gonna continue to focus on and double down on. And I believe that we will continue to see growth and, and improvement holistically and specifically driven by those areas. Again, looking at how we do more to you, utilize our teach education program, our teachers. I have uh, Dean Lewis, uh, Leonte Lewis, who is on the call with us. Uh, Dr. Scott was also brought in. There were some disconnects and we wanted to make sure that we had a strong enough gap or field gap to make sure that students were not falling through the cracks because Coppin State and Coppin Academy, even though they set on the same foundation, were not operating as seamlessly as they possibly could. Those are some of the areas that we have been focusing on. And I think that as we move forward, we'll continue to strengthen the educational foundation for the students at Coppin Academy. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Reed. Commissioner Sally, I see your I see your hand going up and down. Or do you have a question or comment, Commissioner Sally? I do. I'm so sorry, I was having a little bit of technical difficulties here. But um, you know, I, I want to be really clear that one of the areas that Comp Academy was cited for is just where we are on the college career ready to scale. I I'm hoping to hear a little bit more brass tacks about what Coppin Academy as an operator can do to partner with the school to really boost that, right? So, you know, recognizing that one of the strengths of, of having an operator that is um, a, a college is an opportunity to help young people really understand um, what does college and career readiness look like um, through a number of different pathways. Um, but it's something that, you know, it concerns me on this side of the, the aisle to really see like where we can see continued improvement in that area. Thank you, uh, Principal Alvin. I'll take a shot at that first and you can fill in uh, elsewhere. So uh, again, like I said, some of the things we've been doing differently. Prior to my arrival, we had little to no students taking dual enroll classes at Coppin Academy. Uh, this past year, uh, we had north of 70 students who were taking dual enroll classes. We talked about our Eagle Achievement Center, which is a state-of-the-art facility that we just opened that provides a 360 view of students and looks at their holistic development and the wraparound support services that they need to be successful. We didn't have that on the college campus previously. We now have that. Our students at Coppin Academy has full access to that facility with our supplemental instruction, our faculty expert, and our peer coaching. So that's going to make a significant difference as we um, uh, uh, move them to have a better or different, I should say, different understanding about what it is to be on a college campus. One of the other things that we are looking at with our dual enrollment courses where some schools uh, use teachers in the school, we have the ability 
to take our Coppin Academy students and immerse them in the academic classroom with Coppin students. So they can start to understand what the rigors of colleges is like, the expectation, the pace of college courses. And that I believe will also add value to their overall growth and understanding of what it means to be at a university. So those are just some of the things that we are focusing on that we believe will help our, our students better wrap around support services, greater um, uh, uh, connection to the university and our faculty, and better connection, making sure that we can identify problems that they're facing early on and have more proactive interventions. And also, if I, I'm sorry, if I could just go ahead. Oh, go ahead. No, I, one, let me say one point I, I think is really important to notice too is there's got to be a strong correlation between guidance counseling um, along this pathway. And so this is where I expect, you know, um, there's an opportunity for Coppin to step up in this respect. So not only the university, but also the school itself to recognize the link when we're talking about really strong college and career prep preparation, that's got to be there as well. Yeah, and so I'd that's love definitely. to share. Oh, thank you. I'd love to share just to give context. Um, uh, the board was given a two pager um, that has additional data points in there to uh, let you know that um, that we do believe we have an exemplary um, college model. We have been offering college courses and students getting a bachelor's degree. Um, for years, as uh, Dr. Jenkins alluded to. Um, just in the class of 2023, almost 50% of the students have earned at least three college credits. Um, and so, and it, if you, I don't want to drone on about, um, about numbers, but 32% the year before. The pandemic hit us hard, right? But we had things before and after, and if you look at that two pager, you'll be able to see kind of the before and after and that we're still on our track. We have six students um, this year who are slated to come to Coppin State on a full ride. Um, and so those students are excited to, um, to get to Coppin State so that they can continue their baccalaureate uh, program. Um, we do have that support um, from Coppin State, but also in the building. Our college bound counselor, we've been a college bound foundation school since 2014, um, and they have worked tirelessly, um, our counselors, to ensure that students receive that access to get um, um, full rides or um, other parts that they need so that they can be successful. Um, we know that things are difficult, but I feel very confident and I um, know that we will continue to be an exemplary program um, for the city and for our students in the community to ensure that students um, become graduate as sophomores um, to uh, continue their, um, their bachelor's program at Coppin State. Thank you so much, Principal Orman and uh, President Jenkins for that. Chair, and uh, Board Chair, I'm Richardson. I saw your hand up. Um, I, it was up, but I know we have a ton of other schools to get through. So I'll put my last question in writing and submit it to, um, to the operator to respond to. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or thoughts from board colleagues, commissioners? The teacher in me just loves wait time. You know, I'm just, I'm just waiting, <laughs> <laughs> um, but not too long because we definitely have several other schools to go. Thank you to the Coppin Academy um, team for being with us tonight. And again, as our board chair reminded us, if there are additional questions that may come up between now and next week, um, board colleagues, please send those questions in, um, preferably by the end of this week, so that we can get a response back from our teams. Um, our school teams um, in preparation for our vote next week. Thank you, Coppin team. Um, Ms. Thank, Ann, you. Uh, Ms. Thank, yeah, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Alvarez or Trevor? Uh, yeah, so our next school is uh, the Crossroads School operated by Living Classrooms. Um, they are recommended for an eight year renewal. Uh, they were effective in uh, academics, climate, and financial management and governance. Good evening, my name is Jacob Prosnett and I'm the director of the Crossroads School from the Living Classrooms Foundation. I'm joined tonight by members of the Crossroads community, the Greater Living Classrooms community, and staff and students to share how honored we are to have been recommended for an extended eight-year renewal. 
and we ask for the board's support for this contract. This year, Crossroad celebrates its 20th year. We have appreciated engaging in this process with the school system and the board, and we are excited to tell you a bit about our school community. And as always, you're invited to come to visit before or after the board vote. Crossroads mission is to create the space for children to evolve as individuals and as a community through urgency, rigor, expectations, and kindness. We are extremely proud that our mission and vision is a living document and that our staff and students have created a positive school environment as evidenced by our effective ratings in climate, academics, and governance. As the operator, I also know that this recommendation from Dr. Santelisis and team is due to the amazing work of Crossroads staff and students. And now I'm fortunate enough to pass it to one of our eighth grade leaders, DeAsia Banton, to share a bit about her Crossroads experience. Of my experiences at Crossroads. It is hard to pinpoint one thing that I like about Crossroads because I like the school so much. I really like the community. They're so inclusive and that reflects off the teachers and onto the students. It produces this warm and comfortable environment. In sixth grade, we were virtual all day and I still felt like I was able to reach out to my teachers and talk about random stuff that was going on. I was able to build close connections. I even had monthly check-ins with my principal and he asked how I was doing, if my grades were good and if I was struggling with virtual. Luckily, I had a leg up because my sister went to Crossroads and I knew about the school. I feel like I've become more outgoing in Crossroads and in elementary I was more closed off. I'm also in debate club too so maybe that's why I was asked to speak today. I was also able to take honor science in eighth grade and want to continue into science when I'm in high school. I find out my results today so fingers crossed. Thank you so much and I'm going to pass it off to Mr. Ebert. Good evening. Uh, my name is Matthew Ebert and I have had the pleasure of being the principal of the Crossroads School for the past 10 years. During this time, our team is proud of the work that we have done in the school community that we have created. Here are some pieces to highlight. Uh, in academics, Crossroads has made adjustments over the course of the contract to its math program, where it's expanded access to pre-algebra for seventh graders and algebra one for eighth grade students. We currently have honors um, science classes in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, and a small group science class to make sure that kids who are struggling get the support that they need. Uh, while we know that PARC and MCAP scores are just one barometer for student success, According to the most recent testing data, we help the district by scoring um, higher than district average in almost all categories. In climate, um, we're very proud of the work that we do, and uh, due to our small size uh, and our excuse me, I, 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 give me one second. I just want to make sure, and if we could just pause the time, I just want to make sure that everyone is muted unless you're presenting. We're getting quite a bit of feedback, and it's quite disruptive. So if you're not presenting, please make sure that you're muted. And it looks like I was muted too, as a result. <laughs> so please go ahead, um, please proceed. All right, thank you so much. Um, so due to our small size and deep relationships, Crossroads sees family engagement as paramount to our success. We rated effective in the family survey and highly effective in cohort retention. We know these authentic and close connections allow our school to ensure we're creating a healthy space for our kids. Our schools adopted restorative practices as a way to support all the young folks as they grow in regards to academics and social emotional learning. Um, and while we're really proud of all of those things, uh, we always know there's places to improve. So one of the areas um, that we're gonna continue to work on is our commitment to DEI practices. We'll continue to make sure that our students have access to rigorous instruction and grade level content. We've adopted the Facing History curriculum and we'll continuously audit our curriculum and plan to make adjustments. We'll continue to make sure that our celebrations, materials and events are focused on intentional methods of centering history and culture of the student body beyond oppression and work to uncover biases. Just this month, we have had the chance to uh, go to Goucher College to see a play focused on black history, um, Harlem Renaissance performance at the symphony, and multiple classrooms are engaging uh, students with heroes both known and unsung. We wanna thank the board for the time and support of our school and we welcome any questions. Well, uh, Four colleagues uh, gather their thoughts if there are any questions or concerns. First, thank you to the Crossroads team for being present tonight um, and for the work that you're doing um, with our young people within city schools. Um, what I do want to just highlight and shout out um, is the attendance rate. Your, our students are coming to school at the Crossroads School um, and the attendance rate is above our district's average. Um, so it seems like there are supports that are in place for our young people there, and, and it's great to hear about the restorative practices being 
um, engaged with, with our students. I'm very familiar with restorative practice processes and, and, and all of that. Um, but there are some inconsistencies as it relates to um, suspensions out of time school. Um, so can you all talk to us just a little bit more about some of the strategies that you all are engaging um, in to really support our young people and to provide more in school time um, as much as possible. What are some of the trends, I guess I'm thinking of as a school leader that are causing students to um, ha have to receive that level of consequence? Gotcha. Um, yeah. You know, as they then are removed from instructional time um, to face, you know, realities of consequences sometimes. But what are you, what are you noticing there and what supports are being um, put in place to kind of um, support those students that seem to enjoy being in school, stay yeah. in school? So it's a great question. And I'm going to give you the honest answer to everyone on the call. I'm just, I'm going to be transparent, honest, right? Um, we are a small school with wonderful relationships with kids. We don't believe in suspension as a holistic policy. We don't believe in it. And we do everything possible beforehand. If you look into our numbers of suspension over the past 10 years, almost consistently, you'll see repeated suspensions of certain children. And if you dig in those numbers, you might see special education as well. One of the biggest challenges we've faced um, in terms of support is we put a lot of supports in place for our kids with um, who you know, special education is a wide gamut. I was a kid in special education, so please know that I'm not putting kids in a box. It's this piece of there are kids who struggle with regulation and who need more supports um, than can happen in LREA or LREB. And so one of those challenges has been working with everyone to continue to do enough supports quickly so that we don't face the consequences of suspensions and yet get more support for those kids within the city school system where there are wonderful programs to support them. Um, and so even when we do do suspension, we are doing it in collaboration uh, with our families, uh, which is a tricky thing to say, but it's an honest thing to say. Uh, those are the biggest numbers of our suspensions historically in our school. Um, and while we don't relish it at all, um, they're often done for safety or because we have to have the consequence according to the code of conduct. Um, that said, we are always uh, looking for ways to improve how we do the work. We want our young folks in school when kids are away they're not engaged with the academics, they're not engaged with the culture, and they just become farther removed from those successes. Uh, we know that, we honor that, and we're open to all um, ideas. And several of our other schools have been really helpful in that conversation in my 10 years of like, hey, y'all, what are you doing? Because you're doing better than us here with this. Like, what, what, what magic do you guys have? And that's kind of what brought us to more official restorative practices, communicating with those schools and saying, what y'all got going on? Because we're not happy with where we are just yet. Thank you for that, Commissioner Brooks. Yeah, I just wanted to hear a little bit about um, if you could talk me through um, sort of the restorative justice, uh, restorative practices piece of uh, the school day, right? And so um, I'm just curious, as you know, uh, uh, Commissioner McFadden talked about it in the context of suspension. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about what your practices are and then specifically um, how you've seen them impact the academic um, outcomes for the students at your uh, your school. Absolutely. Um, so thank you for that. Earlier this year, we had some folks from another charter school come visit. And uh, when they came to visit our school, what they left with, one of the things they said that really stuck with me was, you don't have the restorative practices posters all over your building, but you feel it in the school, right? Um, so I would tell you as a small school, we're able to do a lot of things formally and informally. So the restorative practices happen as needed all the time. We're dealing with 11, 12 year olds, 13 year olds and 14 year olds, right? Like they, they are who they are and they're lovely folks. Um, and there's a lot of conversation about growth in terms of being young people and becoming leaders. So in our school, you may see it in areas uh, working with the Dean when there's a negative interpersonal interaction between two 12 year olds, right? Coming together, having the conversation. Um, what role did I play? What role did you play? What do I need moving forward? Right, that restorative practice language that again we act we legitimately got from another school in the district that had done the work longer than us. You may see us sitting in the halls holding hands with kids who are stressed out of a recess and somebody took their football and they're real angry about it. It may get bigger and seem in terms of having families involved uh, when there are more um, escalated challenges or more ongoing challenges and we bring them through to those same pieces. Um, you'll also see it in our mentoring work, right? So every well, prior to pandemic, all of our kids had mentors from outside 
buildings. Currently, it's only sixth graders due to hybrid workforce um, outside the school district. And so those conversations happen there too, right? Crossroads is a lot more than academics. It's about being a person, being a kind person and seeing others. Um, and so it's one of those things that you come in and you see it and feel it from the conversations we have when things are going wrong to when it's going right. If you're there on Monday mornings, you'll see morning meeting with the whole school. Um, and you'll see how we're talking and what we're talking about and how that impacts the mood and tone of the day and the week. Um, but I'd also invite you to come see it. Um, and we'd love to have you uh, come tell us how we're doing. And if you see something we could be doing better, we'd welcome it. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to yeah. just uh, just appreciate that. And then to just um, name that one of the most important things I, I, I appreciate about this um, and the work that you all do around restorative practices is that um, there is no conflict between restorative practices, SEL, and academic achievement. You all can do it all. You know, they're tied. They're tied exactly. together, right? Yeah. And I think sometimes, I think uh, in some spaces, and in particularly some schools, I feel like the, the narrative and the discourse is that they don't happen in the same way. And so I'm grateful that you all have found a way to tie them very ni nicely together to actually get yeah. to the outcomes that you all want to see. We appreciate that. We're a fortunate space. We have really great folks. Thank you for that, um, Dr. Brooks. Any additional thoughts or questions for the Crossroads team? Thank you um, to the Crossroads team so much. Um, and I just want to make sure that we don't have any additional hands uh, raised for questions. I don't see any. Um, thank you to the Crossroads team. Um, thank you. And we look forward to um, engaging within the next week. All right, before we. Sounds before good. We go. Thank you, Ms. So All right, come visit, y'all. Y'all be good. Okay, our next school is Empowerment Academy, um, operated by the Empowerment Center. The recommendation is for an eight-year renewal um, with audit reviews at the three and six-year marks of the contract. The school was rated effective in academics, climate, and financial management and governance. Whenever you're ready, empowerment team. Can you hear me? I'm here. Can you hear me? Good. Yes. Good evening. Yes. Good evening. Uh, to Vice Chair uh, Richardson and Vice Chair McFadden, thank you so much for allowing us to come to you this evening. I am Cecil uh, W. Payton, President of the Board of Directors of the Empowerment Center Incorporated, and uh, we are the operators of the Empowerment Academy Charter School. Um, with me today are Mrs. Uh, Dolores Winston, the founder and current board member, and our wonderful illustrious principal, Mrs. Ashley L. Moore. On behalf of the board, we thank you for the confidence that you've had in the Empowerment Academy over the years. We're extremely proud that the CEO has recommended us for an eight-year renewal, and we are proud of our efforts in providing quality education experiences for the students of Baltimore City. However, let me assure you that we are not going to rest on our laurels. Um, we understand that in order to move forward, we must do things a little differently. And um, we know that we believe that a major part of our success is that with us, it's been all about the kids and uh, the kids and also outstanding teachers, students and staff. And based on our success, our plan is to move the school to the next level by becoming a highly effective in all aspects of the program. And um, there are certain things that we're going to put in place to accomplish this in terms of strengthening our outreach to communities and also strengthening our relationship with MT Bank. Uh, we are fortunate enough to have one of the vice presidents to join our board, and that will help us with our financial management system. We're looking forward to that. Um, having said that, I will turn it out over. Dr. Payton, your, your mic accidentally went all off. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah, you were just turning it over to someone. We just didn't hear a loop. Turn it up to Ms. Winston. Thank you, Ms. Winston. 
I'm excited about the possibility of getting an eight-year renewal of our charter for the Empowerment Academy. When I think back over 22 and a half years ago, when in my basement, we began writing a proposal and plan with no funding, but sheer determination for what was then a new school initiative, I can't help but reflect on the work, dedication, commitment, and focus on establishing a school which had at its core academic excellence, integration of the arts, character education, and parental involvement. One where our students recognize that knowledge is power. Our theme then and now remains literacy through the arts, and we have maintained the fidelity of our charter over the years. And so on this renewal year, which represents a series of successful renewals for us, we are celebrating our 20th year anniversary, and we are cheetah proud. Our theme is literacy through the arts, 20 years strong. During the week of May 15th to the 19th, we are planning a series of events that we plan to invite you to, and we certainly hope that you can join us. The first day, May 15th, is a parade and school tour and art exhibit. May 17th, uh, student uh, presentation and reception, and a culminating fundraising activity on May 19th. You will receive an invitation. We hope that you can attend some momentous occasion. Thank you. Mrs. Moore. Board of Commissioners and um, to our CEO, Dr. Cantalises, and esteemed guests and participants in this meeting this after this evening. I am proud, the proud principal of the Empowerment Academy. Uh, my name is Ashley Moore, and I've had the opportunity and the uh, I've had the opportunity to lead this school. This is now my sixth year in the school, so I have been the principal for the full duration of the contract term. Um, so what I would like to say is first is talk about our mission and our vision. Um, so our vision is that 100% of students will be at or above grade level and 100% of our scholars will demonstrate proficiency in an arts discipline uh, through either performance or portfolio because we empower our students to be confident, self-aware, critical thinkers by creating opportunities through rigorous academics and the arts. Um, and there are some things that I would like to highlight here. I'm not sure how much time I have left. Um, but in terms of our academics and our strategic leadership in the arts, like Dr. Payton said, we do not want to rest on our laurels and we always want to take it to the next level. So in terms of, well, first in terms of strategic leadership, um, we've been working on establishing a clear purpose so that students, staff, and families all understand what we are trying to achieve and the goals that we pursue on that day. Mrs. Moore, yes. if you could wrap up your final thoughts. Sure. And what we will see as we continue to answer questions, because I'm sure there will be questions from the board, we'll be able to speak on how we are continuing to plan to increase our strategic leadership, um, our academic academic planning, as well as our strengthening of our arts program. Thank you to the empowerment team. Thank you for the work that you all um, have done um, with our students. Um, we've seen glimpses of it, at least I've seen glimpses of um, a lot of the work that you've done in the arts, actually, um, and student performances, um, seeing some things throughout social media, um, and just listening to members of the community talk about um, a lot of the programming that you all have happening at Empowerment. Um, so thank you all for being present tonight. I'm going to open it up to board colleagues um, who may have um, some questions or thoughts. I see Commissioner uh, Roberts. Commissioner Brooks, your hand is, I'm not sure if that's a hand for um, empowerment or if it was a previous hand. It must be a previous hand. Let me see if I can lower it. Gotcha, I see. Commissioner Roberts. Thank you, Vice Chair McFadden. Good evening to the Empowerment Academy team. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, I just want to create a space for you all to speak to, speak to us a bit about um, improvements to your internal control processes as that was an area listed for developing. Yeah, let me address that. Um, as I indicated in my early remarks, um, we have um, strengthened our partnership with MNT Bank 
and they've decided to come in with us and uh, help us strengthen our internal controls and also look at our financial management plan uh, completely. Um, as a matter of fact, um, they're going to completely re redo the plan that we have in place right now because there's some things they saw that needed strengthening right away. And uh, so we're well aware that um, it's not that the plan is very weak, but it's just it needs some strengthening. So um, we've partnered with them and they're going to come in and help us do that. I'm sorry. Thank you so much for that. And now, will that be on a reoccurring basis? Is that a long term Absolutely. solution? That's as long as it's necessary. And, and uh, we're just pleased to have that um, vice president from the bank on our board. Thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner Roberts. Any additional questions or follow up thoughts from board colleagues? Chair Emeritus. Whoops. Uh, thanks. I, I, I'm hoping that what I'm asking is will allow uh, Principal Moore maybe to expand a little more where she had, was stopping because one of the areas um, that was also sort of flagged was around the, fi uh, the five essentials, the survey and some of that information. So could you just talk a little bit about you, you were saying uh, wanting to help uh, uh, students as well as community and families to really understand um, the purpose of the school and things that are happening. So I wanted to give you time to talk a little more about that. Thank you for the question. Um, so there are three things that we must highlight with the survey, right? Um, one part was strategic leadership. Um, another piece was academics and the perception of the rigor of the academics from the students. Um, and another piece, well, well, those were mostly the, uh, the main two things that uh, we focused on, we completed a full data analysis as a leadership team over the summer. Um, and so what we look, what we found is that we need to improve staff and student relationships um, and increase opportunities for staff to participate in collaborative decision making as far as the school is concerned and also being transparent about communication and uh, making sure that everybody has a shared responsibility for our school. So when we talk about strategic leadership, first thing is establishing a clear purpose and a clear path and a clear vision as to where we are going so that everybody can follow um, that path. Um, like I said before, increasing our shared decision-making collaboration to strengthen that trust and have that transparency amongst our staff and our school leadership. Also increasing, increasing the amount of distributive leadership practices that we have in the school and increasing the leadership of the school. While I was the sole administrator um, of the contract term and we were expanding, um, there was a need to have an additional administrator on the staff, which we added this year. Uh, we also have constant opportunities to provide feedback so that feedback is free flowing and it's not top down. Um, and aligning targeted goals to clear action steps in all aspects of our school, whether that be for academics, whether that be for leadership, or it be for social emotional learning or other climate indicators and data. I also like to credit that to our strong family relationships um, and our strong amount of per, uh, parental involvement and our effective retention rate of our families and our overall strong um, showing in our spring family survey. In terms of academics, we are implementing 100% goals over 90 day increments. So each quarter we have a 100% goal where everything is aligned to that goal. So all staff are clear where our efforts are going to and what we are doing so that we can increase student achievement quarter by quarter. We've increased the support for teachers by having an instructional coach um, so that they feel that they're getting the professional development they need that they, so that they can grow and become the best teachers that they can be. We also implemented small group instruction daily in math and in reading at the elementary level, which has helped us close gaps in terms of literacy and foundational literacy skills, as well as math literacy skills, because math is literacy. We've also had curricular changes in English language arts. Um, we've increased collaborative planning that is teacher led, so teachers identify the areas in which they want to grow, in which they see our students um, need the most support through, date, through thorough data analysis. We've also added uh, vertical and long range planning opportunities for our students on each of our, our staff on each professional development day. And we've also added gifted and advanced learning and honors programming school wide. Um, and 
Also, today we just inducted our first class of National Junior Honor Society inductees tonight, which is why I'm still in the school building because yeah. they're still here. <laughs> so I'm being in two places at once. And also, I was about know, to a, say, I was about to say, I still see you in your office. That's yes. <laughs> And we also know that the arts is a vehicle for learning. We cannot leave the arts out. Um, so we are increasing our arts offerings to our students. This year, we added instrumental music as well as a band and a full choir. Um, and in the next year, we will be get, begin an exploratory program for our elementary students for the arts, and then a transitioning into a performing arts program for our middle school students. So. Um, it sounds like a lot, and it is, but I know that we're not going to rest on our laurels, and we're going to achieve and go beyond that. Thank you so much. You'll have a busy six years. <laughs> yes, we do. Thank you, Chair Emeritus, and, and I appreciate um, you for mentioning um, the addition, the staff that you have, um, yes. but specifically the addition addition to your admin team. That's that that's critically important um, to support um, that five essentials, um, you know, in, increase. That's critically important. Um, in addition to what I heard you mentioned, that teacher led um, those professional learning communities, having the teachers own um, the data that they're seeing, the work that they're doing with the students, um, and how students are able to achieve. So, so hopefully, as a result of that, we'll see more of those survey results come back in a more favorable way. Um, but it sounds like um, you're doing some incredible work. You're leading incredible work um, at the school. And I say that because you've been the sole administrator, right? But now you're increasing. Um, I'm sorry. I do have to say it is all of us, like Dr. Payton said, it is our governing board. Um, it is our staff, um, our teachers, and I mean not just our instructional staff, our sports staff, our custodial staff, our secretary staff, secretarial staff, and our families. It is truly a community. We believe that it takes a village to raise a child, and I cannot take all that credit because without them, the Empowerment Academy would not be the amazing village that it is. I, I appreciate it. Yeah, I, I said, I, yeah, I, somebody has to leave. And she's done that. I, absolutely. That's that's what I that's what I was gonna say. Mm -hmm. Right. There are you've got to own the leadership actions that you have been taking um to really collaborate and galvanize the staff and community to do its best work for young people. Um so thank you to the empowerment team. Um are there any additional uh thoughts or questions from uh, my board colleagues? Thank you. Thank you to the empowerment team. Um, and thank you. Thank you. Have, thank you. Have a great evening. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, Ms. Alvarez, Trevor, we are ready for um, our next school. Thank you. Our next school is um, Hampstead Hill Academy, operated by Baltimore Curriculum Project. Uh, they are recommended for an eight year renewal. They are highly effective in academics and climate and effective in financial management and governance. Are you waiting for, are you, are, are you finished, Trevor? Should I go? Yep, you can go ahead, oh. Laura. <laughs> Sorry, I've, I've already eaten into the four minutes. Um, good evening, commissioners. I'm really, really happy to be here tonight to talk about Hampstead Hill Academy and to answer any questions you have about our school. Um, I'm Laura Doherty, and I'm the president of the Baltimore Curriculum Project, and I'm joined here tonight by Principal Matt Hornbeck. Um, I'd like to thank ONI for the extensive thorough and transparent process that is nearing completion tonight. And I'd like to thank Dr. Santelises for concurring with the recommendation to renew for eight years, and we hope you will as well. Um, we're really <clears throat> thrilled to, to have that. It's the culmination of a long, a lot of years of working together. Um, we were in this seat last year with the renewal of two other BCP charter schools, uh, City Springs and Frederick Elementary were up last year. So some of you are familiar with this, but I know there's been 
um, some people who have joined since last year. So I'll talk briefly about the Baltimore Curriculum Project, and then I'll turn it over to Matt to talk more specifically about Hampstead Hill. Uh, BCP operates six conversion charter schools in Baltimore City. Uh, each are unique in many ways, and uh, each share some critical components. The shared components are uh, a commitment to supporting and retaining really great principles, uh, ample and intensive side-by-side -side classroom coaching and targeted PD to improve uh, teacher performance. Um, we began using restorative practices 15 years ago, and each of our six schools is committed to its use. Uh, and we have been using a reading curriculum um, with loads and loads of evidence of effectiveness since we began working with city schools in 1996, that was 27 years ago. Uh, reading mastery is the engine for school improvements uh, because it moves our students quickly and successfully from learning to read to reading to learn. Um, so with that introduction, I'm going to turn it over to um, one outstanding principal, Matt Hornbeck. Am, uh, am, is, is my mic on? Can you guys hear me? You're yes. good. No? Okay, thanks, Laura. Good evening, I'm Matt Hornbeck, and for 20 years I've had the best job in the world as the principal at Hampstead Hill Academy. I want to recognize the hard, smart work of more than 100 HHA staff, who believe in the power of restorative practices, truly know our students, plan and teach amazing lessons, and based on actual student data, reflect and adjust their expert practice. We are a highly diverse neighborhood school. We serve a school community that's 45% Hispanic, just and 35% white. We have a highly skilled, stable group of simply outstanding staff and supportive, involved parents. We're particularly proud of our middle school leaders go places program which brings together 300 middle school students in one room each week to thank each other apologize to each other and learn about careers from guest speakers students can earn wonderful trips for community service scholarship and citizenship while there's much work to be done in light of this year's mcap results we were gratified to have more students score proficient than the state of maryland averages in both reading and math by having proficiency levels that are higher than most LEAs in the state, HHA contribute to, con contributes to city schools' success in raising student achievement. A couple of highlights from our, our MCAP data include an increase in percent proficient across the board for our students with disabilities as well as our English language learners. Although math scores were overall lower, HHA has worked to provide access to higher level math to its students and more students demonstrated readiness to take algebra in eighth grade than ever before. In 2022, 70% of our eighth graders took the algebra MCAP compared to just 39% of our eighth graders in 2019. In light of recent MCAP data, math intervention staffing will be augmented to reach more students. And we will add more initial, initial math training sessions for new teachers, as well as increased math, math sessions at the BCP annual winter assembly. Mr. Hornbeck, you can wrap up your final thought. Yes, um, we're pleased with the district's recommendation to renew BCP's contract to operate HHA as a conversion charter school for the maximum available eight year term. In the not too distant future, we hope to secure the remaining funding to expand HHA to include a full size gym, five rooms, uh, lactation room for staff and a more secure entrance vestibule. Thank you for your time, your attention, and we hope your vote. Thank you so much to the HHA team. Um, I do get updates from Principal Hornback um, often, so thank you for that. Um, board colleagues, are there any thoughts or um, questions? I see Commissioner Reed and Commissioner Roberts. Commissioner Reed. Uh, great job. I guess my question is, What's uh, your secrets of success, so to speak, in terms of family engagement? Because I think that's big and important for all schools. So how do you get the family and community engaged in your efforts? And there's some things that I think uh, lots of schools do well, and we do particularly well. We do individual tours for families. Um, I did one today for an hour, and, and um, uh, getting people into the school to see what we're doing is, is a big deal. So we're very conscientious about scheduling people when they reach us. 
Um, but then also having a very robust website, news magazine, Facebook page, um, and then meeting the parents. We, we uh, Large numbers of our staff are outside in the morning, and we're meeting with um, parents and connecting with parents um, as we have 868 students, and there's about 500 parents that drop off every morning, pick up every afternoon. So um, uh, trying to have a robust um, PTO and school family council uh, with um, elections that the school supports. And uh, you obviously have to get a phone call from somebody, uh, Commissioner Reed, if you're going to serve on the school board and you go through a process. And so, um, you know, someone reached out to you and said you'd make a difference. And, and um, uh, we have to do the same thing at the school level and reach out to parents and say they can um, make a difference and come be part of the distributed leadership model here at school. Um, so I think it's also just being consistent and um, answering questions. I give every parent my cell phone number, and um, uh, amazingly, it's it's used um, uh, uh, when it should be used. And um, uh, it's it's very. Um, uh, I think it's a lot about access. Laura, were there other things that I missed? Well, you have standing meetings for uh, your whole community. Uh, a couple of separate types of meetings. Um, um, so, and I know parents take advantage of that, especially once you went um, on with Zoom meetings, you have massive parent meetings because you've made it easy for them to come. So yeah, we have these um, town halls that we call chat with Matt and um, uh, large numbers of people come. So uh, that's, that's a piece of our parent involvement world. You said 800 people. It's 800 students. 868. When you have a, for, you have a comedian, uh, community and family meeting, what's a rough number of people that show up? There are about 550 families that represent the 868 students, and we've, we've had as many as about 150 uh, parents show up um, when we do them online. So um, something in the neighborhood of 25%, um, uh, um, maybe a little more than that. terms of the family groups. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's okay for me to go? Yes. Hello to the Hampton Hill School community. Um, I would be most interested in hearing about some of your targeted efforts to to achieve um, this highly effective in the area of student achievement growth um, and how you all have been able to maintain that. But also if you could you could touch on a bit um, about any collaborative efforts that you have made or have been doing with other school communities to kind of do a problem of practice to share some of those those success stories and, and how to bring others along in the same journey. So um, I work with a lot of the opportunity culture schools and make um, our practices and people come visit and can see what we have going on here. And um, we're going to be doing more of that. But um, uh, in terms of the um, growth that you're seeing, I think that um, uh, it's all about the relationship between the teacher, the content and the kid, um, that instructional core. And we, we look, uh, one of the things that we do each week, we care that teachers plan, but we care more about what they actually do for the, do, do during the week. And so on Fridays, every one of the instructional teachers, anybody who grades kids turns in what we call lesson progress charts. And it's qualitative and quantitative data on how kids are doing each week. Um, and teachers can put, you know, Johnny might need a home visit because he had shown up to school or, um, uh, I'm moving to a new part of the curriculum. Can a coach come help me out? Or here's the students that didn't pass this interim assessment. Um, and we're looking for challenges. Every Monday for two hours, and um, President Doherty comes to these meetings, um, every Monday for two hours in my office, we have our instructional leadership team meet and do, uh, I think in the medical world, they call it a postmortem on what happened, what went wrong and what went right. And then we will make adjustments weekly uh, to be able to try to accelerate kids and 
And we have um, a talent development section of our advancing gifted programming where it's kids who are on the bubble and can get um, with some support identified as advanced. And so that's been a, a rigorous part of the work as well. But um, really, it's the, you know, we have more than 30 kids in every homeroom, 29 homerooms, and it's um, definitely uh, um, very difficult to do the work unless you can attract and retain, as Laura was saying, um, fantastic teaching staff. And we've been we've been working on that um, very hard. Uh, one of the things we did during the pandemic was keep everybody really together and do a lot of parent outreach. And we did um, half day every day rather than the AABB um, setup. And so it was half day AM, half day PM uh, when we were during those years that we were a uh, year and a half that we were um, uh, kind of coming back in a staggered fashion. And I attribute that everyday instruction to some of the growth during this particular contract period. But it's been tough and um, uh, it is not easy out here. So um, we, we appreciate the support of ONI and the board and certainly the um, uh, work of Dr. Santa Lisa and her team and how consistent they've been. Thank you. And especially to Tracy Carter, our executive director um, is outstanding partner in the work. Thank you. Um, that's that's really incredible. Um, that's a great strategy that you mentioned around the progress um, plans, those progress reports. So, so thank you for for thank you for the team um, and the community and um, for all of the work that you all are doing. Are there any additional um, thoughts or questions from board colleagues? Thank you, Hamstead Hill, um, so much for being with us tonight. Um, we're going to move Thanks. on to our. We're going to move on to our next school. Um, I just also want to make sure that everyone who is um, on camera is presenting. So I see Miss uh, Lucia or Miss uh, Lucia. Are you presenting? Are you with one of our schools tonight? Yes, I'm with Patterson Park Charter School. Okay, is Patterson Park up next? Patterson Park's not up next. So if you could just turn your camera off until we get to Patterson. Um, so that we're not um, distracted um, and we can really focus on the schools that are presented. Thank you so much. Um, it looks like we now have Lily May. Yep, Lily we May. have Lily May Carol Jackson School um, operated by Girls Charter School. Um, the recommendation is for a three year renewal. The school is rated developing in academics and effective in climate and financial management and governance. Uh, Lily May team, you can uh, go ahead. Good evening, commissioners. I'm Raquel Whiting Gilmer, a founding board member of Lily May. I am pleased to share on behalf of Monica Mitchell, our board chair, our journey since our last renewal, including our work to continue practices that are a hallmark of our charter and activities to address areas of academic and organizational growth, and our move to a new building, which we knew could be challenging, briefly impacting enrollment and operations, but what was further compounded by COVID. However, we are proud to connect our future in educating girls to the history of the Paquin School and the legacy of the great educator, educational leaders like Dr. Rosetta Stiff. Now closer to our 10 year anniversary, we've turned our attention to building our next five year strategic plan, centering on accelerated academic achievement and organizational stability. The first item on that list was a strategic shift of leadership, prioritizing expertise and sustainability, school climate and program effectiveness. In service of strong collaboration between our board, operator, and principal, we have structurally reorganized. So it is my pleasure to introduce our newly appointed CEO, Dr. Christina Kyle Smith, an important part of our trio. She has over 20 years of experience in all levels of education and a deep knowledge of our school educational model in East Baltimore. In November, I joined Lily May and immediately felt the beauty of a space unapologetically designed to affirm the girls who enter daily. 
As I get to know the community, I feel the power of locating in a reinvestment zone with a rich history. And I'm excited to co-create a space where even my own daughter can attend and grow and learn soon. Our leadership team is talented. Assistant Principal Blake, Directors of Culture, Instruction, and Operations, Ms. Dackett, Ms. Fiddler, and Ms. Ruff, are led by our principal who has years of experience in education, including single gendered educational spaces like Western High School. Together, we have over 50 years of experience in education. The team started the school year strong with a supportive board, committed community, educational partners, engaged parents, and amazing support of ONI, Ms. Carter, and BCPS. I'm humbled to introduce Ms. Washington, our new principal, another important part of our trio. We have worked tirelessly and in sync with staff to center joy, improve climate, and fully implement restorative practices. We have installed a comprehensive climate team and are on track to reduce suspensions by almost 30% this year. Our curriculum has been updated to be more inclusive, filled with community-based field work, small group supports and interventions. We systematically use progress monitoring and formative assessments to improve teaching and learning and have professional development to address our academic and cultural concerns. We are leveraging and initiating summer recovery programs for all students. There's a co-teaching there's co-teaching in a set of our ELA and math classes performed by our committed team of special educators and a consultant to support students with disabilities. Our attendance has been continually improving. Our, our students are growing academically and feel safe. And a sense of belonging is visibly noted by the comfort they have in storing their book bags and hallways as they travel to class and lunch. The Sisterhood Fawcett at Lily May creates habits of success that last beyond their time in our school. Lily May graduates are prepared for high school, pursue postgraduate opportunities, set high expectations for themselves, and persevere through hard work. Our challenges are perplexing, but surmountable, surmountable. I'm sorry, four minutes are up if you want to do your last thought. Thank you. So therefore, we're requesting five years renewal to continue and foster the growth of our vision and mission and address our challenges. We've implemented a comprehensive enrollment strategy, and we are already seeing the visible positive results of our work. We thank you for your time and your consideration for renewal and look forward to continue to serve and empowering young girls in Baltimore. Thank you so much um, to the team, um, to the women that are leading um, this incredible school um, in, our, in our school community. Are there any uh, comments or thoughts, questions from our board colleagues? Board Chair? Yes, thank you, um, Vice Chair McFadden. I just wanted to say that I did have the pleasure of visiting this school and um, I am convinced that finally the right butts are in the right seats and that um, this school is really positioned and poised in, in, my, in my humble opinion to, to do some great things. Um, we were dreaming together about um, just some conferences and, and getting, doing some kind of citywide things with, um, girl, you know, schools that that support girls education in the city of Baltimore. So I just want to congratulate this school. You guys rebounded from some pretty tough challenges. Um, and I just believe um, the best is yet to come. So thank you for hosting me in your school. And um, I really did appreciate the time we spent together. The pleasure was all ours. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Richardson, Commissioner Coy. That's yes, wonderful. I also had the opportunity to, to visit and spend some time with you all. One question that I had that I just want you to have an opportunity to speak to a little bit is what you have been doing recently to improve um, the quality of student discussion. That was one item that in some of the essentials um, uh, was not as, as highly rated at the time that the, the uh, assessment was, was taken but want to hear about some of the things that you've been working on to improve that. I know I saw some of them, but, but I'm just giving you the chance to speak to them. Well, there's two main stays that allow for our students to build um, a strong confidence in having collaborative discussions. 
all of those are also tied to our arts integration that allow for our students to build that confidence in being present presenters of themselves and of their thoughts, as well as their active citizenship. But in classrooms, our school starts and end with crew. Um, and we have the slogan, along with other EL schools, that we are crew, not passengers. And we spend time specifically and deliberately teaching students about the way in which they can engage in conversations. That it's often thought of as a process for just getting students to have a social emotional aspect of school, but technically it's really to build academic peers for the rigorous curriculum work that they're going to get involved in. So them being able to start every morning reflecting on the challenges that they're going to face, the work that they're, they're moving towards, and how they plan to use what we call home targets um, or character or habit and success in order to move that work on a daily basis allows for them to ground themselves. So then you'll hear them talk about things of persevering through difficult challenges or look, we were collaborative today, that's great. When they get into class, we also work very hard to make sure that our students are engaged in project-based hands-on instruction. And so they often work as in teams um, or in small groups to accomplish academic tasks, um, which also involves them being extremely collaborative and communicative together as well. Um, so you'll see our students often with clipboards, walking around, using those particular um, uh, speech, speech skills to be able to really dive into content. We feel and we believe that when students are able to engage in that type of collaborative conversation, they're able to unpack complex texts. They're able to unpack, unpack complex topics as well, even better together, using more relevant examples and ideals that complement the teacher's instruction. And I just, if I can add, I don't want to take too much time, that um, I'm really proud of um, Swashton and Ms. Fiddler and, and the team and especially Ms. Stockett. They've been working really hard on making sure that our professional development mirrors our student work. So you'll come to um, NEPD on our Wednesdays and you'll see our students, our teachers starting in crew and ending in crew using the same habits that we put in classrooms, but also them working really hard to reflect on what is hindering our students' engagement and how to um, kind of lean into each other's expertise and thoughts and wins in order to take them themselves. So for example, our last professional development, I heard teachers talking about how can they better unpack sentence stems for certain aspects of their work to have students um, engage in more higher quality academic and, um, conversation. It was, it was really beautiful. Thank you all, and thank you to the members of the Lily May Carroll Jackson School community just watching um, the chat and all of the um, support that is um, here tonight. So thank you all for being present. Thank you to the team um, for being here, um, and please have a good evening. Thank you all so much. Um, Ms. Alvarez, Trevor, we are ready for our next school. Okay, we're going to move on to Midtown Academy. Um, operated by Midtown Academy Incorporated. Uh, the recommendation is for an eight-year renewal with audit reviews at the three and six-year marks. Uh, the school is rated effective in academics, climate, and financial management and governance, and the Midtown team can uh, take it away. Good evening. My name is Suzanne Penny, principal at Midtown Academy. I began my time at Midtown as a third grade teacher, was then the assistant principal for eight years, and am now in my eighth year as principal. I am joined by Midtown Academy Inc. Board Chair, Michael Booth. I am honored to speak on behalf of our school community. We are proud to have earned the recommendation for an eight-year renewal. Midtown began as a new school initiative in 1997 and over the years has worked its way to be a great school choice for so many families in Baltimore. We sit on a small corner in a small historic building without an inch to spare. While Midtown may be one of the city's smallest schools, both in physical size and student population, we believe the impact our school has on its students is huge. At Midtown, our vision is uniting diverse communities, igniting a passion for learning and developing outstanding global citizens. At Midtown, uniting diverse communities means finding value in our differences. Differences can bring challenges, but it's how we work through those that matter. At Midtown, every voice is important. While we believe a passion for learning lives in every child, our Midtown staff work with families to help ignite that passion and keep it burning. We engage students by teaching reading and writing through compelling topics in science and social studies. Whether it's our middle school grades studying live zebrafish in partnership with Carnegie Mellon University, 
or our fourth and fifth graders studying the Chesapeake Bay in partnership with the National Aquarium, or our youngest learners harvesting their own butterflies. Our students learn that a good education is something they must engage in, and they do. Midtown students also begin to understand the role they play in our community and the impact they can one day have on a global level through community projects and events. As we reviewed our renewal report, we were proud of many areas that we were rated highly in. Through high teacher retention, sustained leadership, building strong relationships with our families and students, we consider ourselves Midtown strong. We are proud of the highly effective rating in climate and culture based on the five essentials survey. We cannot do this work without the support of and partnership with our families. We are grateful for our volunteer board of directors, which has operated effectively and met all critical district and federal obligations. Reviewing the effective MCAP score in ELA K through eight and the developing MCAP score in math K through eight, those will guide our next layers of work. We will review the 45 minute intervention block we created when we returned from virtual learning. We will review our use of and implementation of Eureka Math. And as always, we will consider the needs of our current students. We hope to continue to see great growth in our student achievement. I will be honest though, that the real success is felt when alumni visit and share what our school meant to them and the success they are experiencing as young adults today. With a wait list year after year of over 180 students for only maybe 30 openings, we hope to be able to offer our program one day to more Baltimore City students and families. I would like to take a moment to publicly thank each and every one of our staff members from the classroom teachers to the cafeteria manager to the nurse and secretary IEP chair related service providers. Every single adult in our building is a teacher together each day we persevere to help all of our students thrive and become the best version of themselves. I would like to thank city schools and the board of commissioners for its support of Midtown over the past 20 plus years and we look forward to being a school choice for many years to come. Our commitment to the students of Baltimore City will not waver. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Can you talk to us a little bit about your audit controls? Sure. Um, so I'm not sure. I don't see Michael Booth, who is our board chair. Um, so I will speak to that. But we do do um, our board has a finance committee that reviews um, monthly our financial report, as well as an annual audit from an outside agency um, that reviews our financials, gives us recommendations, and the board takes those into considerations as we continue um, to develop how how our finance committee functions on our board. I think I do see uh, Mr. Booth. I see him uh, if he yeah, wanted I'm, to chime in. I can, oh, I can't see. I'm, I can't I can, see you, Michael. I, I'm sorry. Yeah, that, that's fine. <clears throat> I mean, Suzanne, you covered it, but I'll just speak to that briefly. I think um, Suzanne mentioned volunteer board. So myself, having been associated with the board for a long time, in uh, board engagement so mr booth you're going in and out you're frozen if i could turn off the camera um you know so we're aware of that and we will that it will be an area of focus as as we go through the you know the next few years of our charter <laughs> I don't know and if there's so any more questions. Part of, it's also a part of um, the recommended conditions as well. So just wanted to yeah, make sure exactly. that we um, raise that in this space. Are there any additional uh, questions or thoughts from uh, board colleagues? Thank you to Midtown Academy. Um, and thank you for shouting out all of your school staff. Um, it's important to acknowledge the work of all of the folks that are lifting um, the weight for our young people and for our community. So thank you to, to Midtown Academy. Thank you to the members of the com from the Midtown community that are with us tonight as well. Um, and certainly, um, Michael, you, you don't have to mention anything about a volunteer board. <laughs> a volunteer board. Um, we all know exactly what that feels like. Um, here um, to do some great work for our children in Baltimore City. So thank you all. 
Um, uh, Ms. Alvarez, Angela, and Trevor, we are ready to move on to our next school. Okay. The next school is Patterson Park Public Charter School, uh, operated by Patterson Park Public Charter School, Inc. The recommendation is for an eight-year renewal. The school is effective in academics and financial management and governance and highly effective in climate. Patterson Park, you can take it away. Hi, good evening, commissioners. I'm Jane Linenfelser. I'm the executive director of Patterson Park Public Charter School Incorporated. I'm joined this evening by the administrative team and members of our school community to thank Dr. Santalisas for her recommendation and to ask for your support for an extended renewal of PPPCS's charter contract. Our mission centers children as the core of our teaching and learning community and recognizes that an effective education is one that serves the whole child. As such, we wanted you to hear directly from one of our students, Ms. Olivia Wesby. My name is Olivia Wesby. I'm in eighth grade. I'm also the student council president at Patterson Park Public Charter School. I've been at PPPCS for about 10 years now, and it has been a second family to me. I love PPPCS because of the people here. They treat me as if I was their own child. They know when I'm not feeling my best and they help guide me through it. PPPCS gives students opportunities for hands-on learning. I remember in pre-K, my teacher brought a represent representative from Barks into our class to teach us how to interact with dogs safely. In fourth grade, I went to Junior Achievement Biz Town and I was elected mayor. That was a really cool experience. These past few years as a middle schooler have been awesome. My teachers have given me the time and space I need to be a teenager. My middle school years started virtually, virtually during the pandemic, but that was when I developed a love for literature from my ELA teacher. I was elected student council president and I traveled to Washington DC for the Black Youth Engineering, Engineering Conference with my gal instructor. Over spring break, I will be headed to South America for a trip abroad with our eighth grade class. All of these experiences are unique to PPC, PPPCS, the enrichment programs in addition to the strong academic curriculum have qualified me to apply to some of the top high schools in Baltimore City. I hope the board will grant my school an extended charter renewal so that other kids can have the same experiences I had at PPPCS. Thank you, Olivia. Like Olivia, we believe PPPCS is deserving of an extended contract and specifically our school was rated effective or highly effective in 15 of the 21 rubric categories. We're proud of our work and want to highlight a couple things. Academically, we've remained true to our mission and vision as evidenced by the highly effective rating in the vision and engagement domain, and we're contributing to raising student achievement in BCPSS. As was shared with the board, our students achieve strong growth in the park assessment. Uh, we recognize that there's room for growth after the first year of MCAP, and we are also proud of our students' initial performance, particularly in sixth grade ELA, seventh grade ELA, seventh grade math and algebra, where our students' percent proficiency surpassed the state average. Um, we're also proud to serve a diverse student population, and notably our MCAP results show that proficiency of students who identify as economically disadvantaged, Black or African American and Hispanic Latino students proficiency was above the district in all tested areas and above the state in ELA grades six through eight. These outcomes are made possible by a strong school climate, a domain where we were rated highly effective. We're proud of our cohort retention rate in the 97th percentile, meaning we retain students and families in Baltimore City. Um, and our attendance rate ranged from 92 to 95 percent, so kids want to be in school. Over the past contract term, we also intensified our focus on equity by adjusting our curriculum, revising our hiring process, engaging in professional development with our staff, and moving to a restorative practices model that showed significant decreases in suspension. Our track record of success shows the impact of a PPPCS education extends far beyond eighth grade. 85 to 100% of our students grad graduates qualify for the city's entrance criteria based high schools and one of the things we're most proud of is that five of our alumni are currently employed at our two schools and that we're enrolling second generation students um, you received the voices um, or you heard from the voices of our, our school community through letters of support um, we also if recognize if you yep. could wrap up your final thoughts, please. Yeah, uh, just also wanted to say we recognize that we're not perfect and we've used this process as an opportunity to reflect and refine our practices, particularly related to intervention, special education and operational management. We're happy to share more specifics about that.
Thanks to the team. Uh, Commissioner Reed. Uh, thank you, uh, Vice Chair. I'd like to uh, give some time for the Duncan girls, see if they have anything to say. I see Kojo Duncan and his daughters. Do they have anything to say? They're pretty energetic, and that's after nine. Those are actually my daughters. Okay. <laughs> one is in second grade, and the other one is an incoming kindergartner next year. <laughs> okay. Oh, so they're, they're insiders. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Over time, I'm looking at... Um, I'm looking at um, a, a trend, a slight, it's like some, it's not a, a horrible attendance rate. I'm looking at um, our students that are receiving special education services um, and kind of like this influx, I'm looking at a more recent decline in attendance with them. Um, and also a higher suspension rate for um, the students with disabilities that are being served at, at the school. Can you talk a little bit about some of the strategies that you all are um, using to support our students, all of our students that are gifted, but specifically our students that are receiving special education supports can illuminate some of that for us tonight. Yeah, we're joined by our administrative team. So if Ms. Suskinsbury maybe speak a little bit to special education supports and then um, Ms. Manning, if you wouldn't mind speaking a little bit to uh, attendance and suspensions. That'd be cool. Suskinsbury, is that Alexis? Good, that good sure is. Good evening. <laughs> good evening. Good evening. Good evening. OK, I'm not going to um, um, have a reunion, but go ahead. <laughs> um, so thank you so much for the opportunity to share um, our special education team has grown and developed a lot over the past year kind of in throughout this renewal process um, to be fully transparent our iep chair resigned mid-year last year um, and so we were fortunate enough to have one of our strongest special educators step in as our iep chair but what was soon on maternity leave so i, I actually stepped in as iep chair in the interim so we spent a lot of time working uh, with our team to figure out what was the best way to support our students, uh, bringing in different resources to help us to make sure our students were still getting everything that they needed. We ended up hiring an additional special educator and really worked to look at our practices, take feedback from both the audit process um, and the district, as well as our own practices to make sure that each day we're getting better and better to serve our special education students. And my name is Yolanda Manning. I'm the other assistant principal here. Um, and I want to speak more to the attendance. Um, we noticed that over time that students were in and out of school due to COVID related issues or other um, health issues. Um, we also started engaging with families more to see um, what could uh, be some other outliers that kept them out of school. Um, we've um, even gone as far as our family co um, engagement coordinator actually, you know, uh, reaching out to families to be able to go pick them up um, if they had transportation uh, situations that hindered students from coming into school. Um, we're working uh, closely with our families just to identify um, any issues and problem solving with those families to make sure that students are in school on a consistent basis. Right, so coming out of, the, I appreciate that. So coming out of the pandemic, I'm certainly personally working in schools with um, significant um, populations um, uh, of students who are receiving special education services. I'm curious to hear about um, if you've experienced some challenges, like some behavioral challenges, let's say. Um, how does how do you manage those, and how does that correlate to students' academic um, achievement as well? So I think we try really hard to make sure we're looking at the whole child, which is something we really pride ourselves in. Um, and I think strongly believe, as many educators on this call do, that uh, behaviors are often 
just a way of communicating student needs. Um, so if we're seeing an uptick in behaviors, we really try to um, dig into the why behind that and understand more. So make sure that we're providing wraparound services with the student um, and the families and connecting with the families, whether it's a home visit or it's um, bringing in a family member that maybe um, can really support the student in a unique way. So I think we've done a lot of different things. I'm thinking of some specific families, whether it's uh, providing transportation, if they don't qualify for it through some special education services, maybe we're picking them up and bringing them to school every day, really breaking down what those barriers are um, for those students. We have a phenomenal uh, community schools team. Um, and so they provide a ton of additional support that kind of helps us reach out to the families and get to know on a deeper level what the needs are to make sure, again, we can get them into school each and every day, um, and then also support them beyond just the academics. Um, we use restorative practices here at Patterson Park, so oftentimes um, if there is a conflict or behavior, we're making it a learning opportunity. So if a student's having a really rough day, it's not just um, we're going to take a break or we're going to leave. It's really like, let's, let's take this opportunity to learn and grow from this. Thank you for that, Sherry Meredith. Yeah, I just, just quickly, I, I want to thank you for the mentioning about the work you did around equity. I know once we talk about some of the gaps that were happening, but uh, just briefly, can you talk a little bit about, you, you were beginning to mention some things about interventions um, and what is your strategy moving ahead um, into this next contract around um, interventions for students, and I'm assuming by this you mean academic interventions. I'm going to let Mr. Del Toro speak to that one. Hello, everyone. My name is Miguel. My name is Miguel Del Toro, and I'm the principal here at Patterson Park. And this year we began uh, an intervention program that includes multiple uh, tutors in individual grade levels. And we began with a really thoughtful plan, uh, began understanding and unpacking uh, more of our students' needs. We developed uh, groups of students and really uh, identified skills um, based on their academic standing. And so we focused um, on grade level standards, making sure that our instruction is rigorous when students are in the classroom and have identified blocks of intervention where students come outside of the classroom and worked with an interventionist or uh, a tutor um, every day um, on specific skills. Uh, we have adopted an assessment strategy where we assess every quarter and mid quarter um, in order to make sure that we're having our the latest data to be able to best support students in a timely manner. So we're really letting the data do the do our decision making in terms of what students need and being able to provide that support immediately. Um, we've also added a couple of positions to support teacher development um, with a math coach and two reading interventionist and literacy specialists that support planning with our teachers to make sure that our tier one instruction is strong and our students are receiving um, not only grade level instruction, but the students have clear scaffolds to get them to that grade level instruction in the classroom with supports outside of the classroom. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional thoughts or questions for um, the Patterson Park team that's here tonight? Thank you, Chair and Merit. It certainly all uh, means all, and we are uh, committed um, as a school system to make sure that all of our young people are receiving um, the support that they need, um, whether it's academic support, behavioral support. So I appreciate the team um, being here tonight um, to illuminate a lot of the things that you all have been doing um, and what your plans are with moving forward. Um, Alexis Susskinsbury and I, um, we taught together um, at Booker T. Um, and there's something about teaching there and teaching there together um, where, where you just share a bond. So it's good to see you um, tonight. 
um, in leadership. Thank you to the Patterson Park team um, and Ms. Alvarez. We are, and the members of the community and our children that are here that are up late and that should probably be in bed right now. <laughs> Thank you to you all for being here. Um, to our next team, we are ready, Ms. Alvarez and Mr. Uh, Roberts, Trevor. Okay, last but not least, we have the REACH Partnership School operated by Civic Works, uh, recommended for a five-year renewal. They're rated effective in academics, climate, and financial management and governance. Go ahead. All right. Good evening, Dr. Board of Commissioners. Dr. Dr. Gresham, Dr. Gresham, good evening. How are you, sir? I am blessed. It's good to see you, and it's good to see our REACH Partnership ROTC members here with us tonight. I'm not going yes, to take up your time. Yes, indeed. We also are hosting a REACH watch party here at our school. We have about 100 or so folks, as you can see in our cafeteria, uh, all here to support our school renewal efforts. This has been a, a total community effort. Uh, so I want to first start by uh, saying good evening to the Board of Commissioners, uh, Dr. Santalisas, and to the entire REACH school community, especially those who are attending our watch party here tonight. Uh, we are extremely grateful for this opportunity to come before you. Uh, as already mentioned, I am Dr. Gresham, a very proud principal of Reach Partnership High School. Uh, I am, it is an honor to come before you this evening to share a little bit more about the great things that are happening here in our school. Uh, and I want to, again, thank the committee and Dr. St. Elises for the five-year uh, recommendation. Uh, we are extremely grateful for that recommendation. Uh, and there's a, as you know, there's a lot of work that has gone into uh, this process. Uh, and our school has worked very hard to get through this point uh, in our trajectory. Uh, we realize that there's still a lot of work that remains to be done here at our school, uh, but I want to assure the board uh, that we are committed to uh, constantly improving our academic outcomes for our young people and making sure that we provide them with well-rounded instructional programming. Uh, I do not want to take up much of my time because I do want you all to hear from my young people who are doing the great things here in our school, but I will lift up a few things that, uh, as far as our school performance data for the board and their consideration. Uh, over the last contract term, uh, we have improved our attendance rates uh, to 74%. Uh, we have also improved our graduation cohort graduation rates from 61 to 74 percent and our school has demonstrated growth in pretty much every one of those indicators looked at for the renewal process so for that we are extremely proud um, and I want to yield my time to some amazing young people who uh, thought it not rivalry to stay out here tonight uh, to share with this board a little bit about the great things that are happening here at REACH and their REACH experience. So they're going to take about 30 seconds uh, because we realize the hour was getting late, but I think it's important that the board hear from these young people. So I will start off first uh, with, to my left, uh, Mr. Darius Ransom, and he will share his REACH story. Darius? Let's turn it back that way. There you go. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen from the school board. Pleasure to see you again, Commissioner McFadden. My name is Lieutenant Colonel Darius Ransom. I would like to start saying that I'm honored to start to be a part of the renewal ceremony of the Rich Partnership High School. I would like to say that this high school experience is all I could have asked for. Since ninth grade, I've been participating in the JROTC program, or otherwise known as Junior Reserve Officer Training Corps. This course has been great to not just me, but the entire school environment. It has helped me become the person you see in front of you today. It has also propelled me to being, to being more proactive on my road to being accepted into more colleges, thus moving me from good to great. So thank you, Darius. Uh, and next, I would like you to hear from another one of our students who's going to give you a brief uh, up, uh, update on her experience here. Reach Ms. Catherine Alex. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm honored to be here as well this evening. I am um, Cadet Captain Catherine Callis Martinez, and I just want to start off by saying that um, I learned a lot being here at this school. My performance has increased at this school, and being in this general OTC program has um, given me good leadership skills, good leadership skills to um, inspire others around me and my sister and brother. And I just want to say that I've been accepted to UMES, Morgan State, Salisbury University, McDaniel College, and Manhattan College, et cetera. I am still awaiting my decision to MIT, and I am proud to be moving from good to great. Awesome. 
And last but not least, uh, I would like you, you all to meet Ms. Aaliyah Hawthorne, another REACH student. Hi, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time. My name is Aaliyah Hawthorne. I've been a REACH partnership student for the past four years. I am class president, chair captain, and honored to attend REACH partnership. I'm also in the CNA GNA program here at my school. And without REACH partnership, I would be nowhere, not nowhere, but um, I'm grateful to have attend REACH partnership. Um, it's led me to be helped me to be accepted to many colleges such as Clark Atlanta University, Bowie State University, Lincoln University, and hopefully my dream school, Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia. And I'm grateful for Reach Partnership and for moving from good to great every day. And uh, I again, uh, you know, I, I do not want to go over our time. I know we're running late, and I do have a lot of students who are still here in the building because they, uh, I think it speaks volumes to the sense of community that we have uh, established here at Reach Partnership. But I, I'm also joined by a member of our Civic Works Board, who is our school operator, uh, and I just wanted to make sure that they were recognized in this process. So at this time, uh, we will entertain any questions that the board may have about our application. And also, you should have received a uh, packet. Uh, we know that you have re uh, the committee has reviewed our application, but we wanted to kind of send you a visual because it's, it's one thing to read about the great things happening here in our school, uh, but we thought that packet would give you a, a pictorial, if you will, so you can actually see the students in action uh, doing all those things, those great things here at our school. Uh, so we, at this time, we will take any questions that the board may have of us. It is one thing to read about, you know, the great things that are happening at the REACH. Um, it is another thing to actually experience um, what happens in the halls of the REACH Partnership School. Um, and so what I will start off by saying, Look! Look at the look at the cafeteria right now. Are you all paying attention? Yeah, that's community. <laughs> that's the reach. Are you? That's the way it's, it's 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 all good. Um, and I hope that you all are on time for school in the morning. Um, but <laughs> doctor, <laughs> no school um, tomorrow. <laughs> no school. No no. PD. Dr. Gresham, I just want to take a moment to um, applaud your leadership. What we're seeing um, with the REACH's data um, is a consistent upward trajectory. Um, and like I mentioned to one of the previous principals tonight, um, it, we don't recognize our school principals and our school leaders enough for the work that you all do, for the sacrifices that you make, um, for the time that it takes to put plans in place, to make sure that teachers are collaborating, to make sure that you have the right staff, to make sure that there are partnerships. Um, one thing that I've noticed about your leadership, you are big on that word. It's not just the name of the school, but uh, it, it's about the partnerships and you welcome that. Um, and we've had conversations before about different partnerships and how can you continue to welcome more partnerships to support our young people. Um, very proud of the JRLTC uh, members that are with you tonight. We saw them on Tuesday. They were in our boardroom, um, so they stay busy. Um, so it, it's a part of the service mentality that you instill when you're young people, but also on your staff. Um, so it's nice to see, as I started out mentioning that that consistent, that consistent work, right? Consistency is the name of the game. And yes, there are some things that the that the school has to improve upon, right? Um, and you're very honest about that. Um, but I just want to take a moment to just thank the members of the Reach Partnership community that are in that school building right now that are listening. Um, it takes a village. Um, to do this work, so you all should be very proud. And I need some new merch, by the way. I, I need some new merch. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Van, thank you I for wanna, the support. I want to echo the vice chair. I am so proud of the school. Um, Ronald, you may not know, but the ROTC came to support us when, at the last oh, minute, too. right, we needed we needed the school to come back. So they did two times in a row. 
Ransom, you're my dude. Thank you so much you. for all Thank that you, you do. Absolutely, for all that you and the team do to help us with our board meetings. I am so proud of this school and um, Principal you. Gresham, you rock. Thank Truly. You. Yes, thank and you. thank you so much for all you do for our young people. Thank you so much. Commissioner Reed, I see your hand. This is a curious question for me in terms of we always talk about transportation issues. You have all these great students that decide to be out here after nine o'clock. How do they navigate getting home? Uh, that's that sense of community that you see in that cafeteria. As you will notice, there are a lot of teachers and staff members in that cafeteria. We have already coordinated with parents uh, so that we can make sure that each one of our students are getting home safely. Uh, we thought we would be going on at 806 according to the agenda. And, and of course, we're running a little bit behind, but we have already made arrangements with our parents. They know that our students are here uh, supporting this school uh, and this renewal process. So we will ensure that every student gets home safely. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any additional comments or thoughts, questions from board colleagues? Dr. Gresham, talk just briefly, I know it's late, but talk briefly about your CTE programming and then also your access to advanced placement courses um, at, at the REACH. Sure, um, so we offer the pathways that we offer our students in the way of CTE are uh, nursing, carpentry and construction, HVAC, uh, JRLTC, pharmacy, Homeland Security. And then we also have a life skills program here at REACH. But it, what we like to do in each one of these uh, particular CTE pathways, our, my charge to the staff here is to make sure that our students have real world practical experience. So they get the classroom instructional experience, and then they also uh, get real world experience through the form of an internship. So for example, all of my pharmacy students, uh, they work uh, their internship through our partnership with CVS. So if you go to any local CVS uh, here in the Baltimore area in the summer, you will see REACH students behind the counter uh, serving uh, their, through their internship. Our nursing students, they all do uh, clinicals. Uh, we have partnerships with Bottom Lake uh, and also Future Care, uh, where those students actually get to go out to those, uh, develop those businesses and serve and, do, and fulfill, uh, I'm sorry, complete their internship. Uh, we have uh, those type, in, in addition to them earning, uh, completing those practical experiences uh, and getting the internship experience, we make sure that all of our students and every one of our CTE pathways earns, uh, they get a certification in first aid, CPR, AED, in addition to the industry certification for their chosen pathway. Uh, we believe that will make them more marketable in the workplace when they leave REACH. Uh, we also uh, make sure, of course, they're keeping their grades up as well. Um, so each one of those pathways has a built-in practical experience for the students uh, and it also is where they can earn those energy certifications uh, in addition to like uh, the uh, more the uh, OSHA 30 first aid CPR certifications for their uh, chosen pathway. So we are very excited about that. We uh, again, our belief is that this will help our students, you know, to have an advantage in their workforce uh, once they leave us. Uh, but we also are very proud of our college pathway for those students who are interested in going to college. We like to say that it's something for everyone here at REACH Partnership School. Uh, so we do, we have worked very hard to develop not just a uh, college uh, workforce, but also, I'm, I'm sorry, college going community, but we also worked very hard to make sure that we have uh, pathways for those students who are going to industry. So a lot of our students that have come into us now, we are very proud to um, announce that these kids are getting accepted into four-year college and universities throughout this country. We're sending kids to University of Maryland, Notre Dame, Stevenson, et cetera, with scholarships. We, as you heard from these young people, they're waiting for admissions into um, uh, MIT, which is a prestigious university. We have them waiting for admissions into um, Spelman, and they've already been accepted to a number of colleges around the country. Um, so we're extremely proud of that work. Uh, we like to say here at REACH, there's something for everyone, uh, and we embrace our, uh, every student that walks in that door, and, we, and our job is to make sure that we are uh, preparing them for a life beyond high school. And Dr. Gresham, there's there's certainly no harm in the, the Morgan State University acceptances. That Absolutely. <laughs> yes, indeed. And we are sending quite a few students there as well. Awesome. Um, Commissioner Coy. This, this is more of a comment and it's hearkening back, uh, Commissioner Sally and Commissioner Roberts, to 
a data walk we did with the uh, super state superintendent back at the May conference. Uh, I recall you both saying some of those numbers weren't right and and they were showing they were undercounting some of the things that are going on uh, with apprenticeship programs in Baltimore. And I'm just uh, putting a note on this uh, that we should spend some time making sure the state is counting it right because Dr. Grisham, the work that you are doing and you are highlighting, uh, we certainly want folks to to recognize that for what it is, uh, and we recognize it for what it is. So thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Commissioner Coy. I also just want to make note, um, Dr. Gresham, and to the REACH uh, school community, um, that the REACH is not a criteria entrance school. Is that correct? That is correct. Uh, so, uh, I'm sorry, yes, you complete your thought. So the, the school, your the students are coming from all throughout Baltimore City to attend um, the REACH Partnership School. That, that is correct. Uh, we, we, there, we're non-entrance, uh, non-criteria entrance school. Uh, and as you can you note from our application, uh, we have uh, about a third of our students are students with disabilities. Uh, and so we embrace that, um, that challenge and uh, we make sure that we're, again, preparing those students uh, for life beyond high school and making sure they have access to grade level instruction uh, through some of our instructional strategies. Thank you, Dr. Gresham. I appreciate the work that you're doing, the work of your team. Um, one thing that we also know is that you, you also develop school leaders. Um, and so as a result of the work that you're doing as a leader, um, Baltimore City is becoming better because of your leadership as well. So thank you, Dr. Gresham. Um, are there any additional thoughts or um, comments from board colleagues before we wrap up this evening? I look forward to visiting the school sooner than later. Uh, you know, it's more of a we challenge. Have a we have our Black History Month play coming up, which I think you may have, you know, you saw our holiday play, I think, on your last visit, but our Black History Month play is coming up on February 28th. Uh, if you are available, come out and see our young people. Uh, they do what an amazing time? job with this celebration. What time is it, Dr. Gresham? Uh, it's during the day. Uh, we typically do it around 10 o'clock second period, um, but we are looking into doing an evening performance for our parents. Uh, but again, we're trying to work through a lot of logistics around the evening performance. Just keep us posted, please. Absolutely. We'll do. Leah, is some of you on that? Oh, okay. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you to the REACH team. Um, thank you to the REACH community. Um, and and <laughs> Have a, have a good we day. are moving from good to great. <laughs> Absolutely. And Ms. Seals, it's good to see you as well again tonight. Um, when you work in Baltimore City, it's nice to see folks that you have built professional relationships with over time. So thank you. It's good to see you. Ms. Alvarez, Trevor, um, was that our last school or do we have another school this evening? That is our last school. I just want to leave everyone with a reminder that um, uh, the board will be voting on these recommendations at a special meeting on February 23rd. So uh, we look forward to seeing you all in a week. Thank you um, to the Office of New Initiatives. Thank you for all of your work, your tedious work, um, for making sure that we're prepared and as informed as possible. Again, board colleagues, if you have additional thoughts or questions, um, please make sure that we send those to the board office um, so that they can get to Ms. Uh, Alvarez's team um, and to schools so that those schools and those operators have enough time to respond and that we're able to um, make as an informed decision as possible next week. Everyone um, have a great weekend. Young people in city schools, you seem to have a day off tomorrow, but our <laughs> teachers are being developed professionally. So you all have a good evening. Um, folks, and we will see you next week. Have a great evening, everyone. Yeah. Good night, everybody. Good night.